Hey everybody, welcome to Rollback, where we share the best conversations from our pre-video catalog with you for the very first time. Today, we're featuring Tom Harden, AKA Tipper X. Tom is a former Wall Street hedge fund analyst turned FBI informant, turned global keynote speaker. And his story is just absolutely mind blowing. It's almost as if it was ripped out of an episode of Billions. It goes like this. After succumbing to the temptations of insider trading and getting caught, Tom goes on to become one of the most prolific FBI informants in securities fraud history as this mysterious unnamed Tipper X. And he spends years documenting the illegal misdeeds of his friends and his colleagues as this key figure in the Wall Street house cleaning campaign, the FBI deemed Operation Perfect Hedge. And although he's since found a second career, a second life as a successful speaker, at the time of this conversation, Tom had lost his job, he'd lost his friends, he'd lost his standing in his community, his dream, his sense of self, and he found himself unemployable, racked by guilt, and basically alone. So I'm super honored that Tom agreed to sit down with me back then to trust me which was just weeks after his sentencing hearing to share for the very first time on record the details behind the choices he made, the wreckage that it caused, and what he learned about himself in the process. And with that, I give you me in conversation with Tom Harden. I just, I can't even imagine what it would be like to walk uh, a mile in your shoes. So uh, I think it takes a little bit of courage to come down here and, and, and share a little bit. So thank you. No problem. Yeah, I'm pleasure to do it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's been, I would imagine, a pretty crazy past couple of weeks. It was February 25th, right? Where right. you had your sentencing had hearing. Sentencing then, right. And that's kind of the f sort of closing the book or the final chapter on what's been a really long road for you. It was, yes. And uh, we were pretty confident in the outcome that I received, but you never know because um, the judge had not uh, sentenced anybody else in this uh, insider trading ring. So we weren't sure exactly what would happen. Would I get probation or would she throw the book at me or... Mm -hmm. I mean, the possibility existed that you still could go to jail, go right? Go to jail, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have, you know, a five-year-old, three-year-old wife. Um, so that was uh, still a possibility. And um, even though the, the prosecution was recommending probation, no jail, the probation officer was recommending the same thing. Mm -hmm. She still uh, took a few minutes to, to think about it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> a very so pregnant pause. She, she, she heard everybody and said, let me take a few minutes, sort of. Thinking, mm. well, what is there to think there's about? No, there's no, like, mandatory sentencing There are mandatory parameters. sentencing guidelines, but they don't have to stick by that. Mm -hmm. And because of the cooperation, um, they can sentence below that. Right. So I was looking at, if I didn't cooperate, I believe it was 36 months mm -hmm. uh, of, of um, incarceration. And so my cooperation then brings that down. Right. And it helped that the prosecution was recommending yeah, this yeah. light. Yeah, they said know. this was uh, one of our star cooperators and... Um, he did so much for us and, uh, you know, they didn't, they weren't recommending jail time or anything. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, no jail time served, uh, and no probation. Are you you're no not, probation. On, you're not um, on probation? It's, Previous it's, to this, you were just out on bail, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. I had, um, pleaded guilty in December, 2009 and, um, I spent a day in the U S marshal's office being processed. So. Mm -hmm. I was sentenced to time served a few weeks ago, which just meant that time and I was incarcerated for a few hours. And, right. Um, but over the last couple of years, um, I'd been waiting to be sentenced. And so it was kind of a probationary period. I talked to a probation officer a few times. Why did it take six years to sentence you? I don't know. Um, I, I don't think I was a high priority because uh, they were going after all the bad that, guys. That <laughs> right. backlogged. I mean, you're but, a high profile guy. Yeah. You know, like a, everybody knew who you were. Right, and, right. You know. um, it was... Uh, it just kept getting delayed. I kept getting a date. Um, we get ready for it. And then a few weeks out, um, I, I learned it was delayed. And this was a process from 2000. I was in court 2009. I was to be sentenced to 2010. It just took for until mm -hmm. 2015. That so seems crazy. At 37 now, I could be doing something totally. I could be in my second career already. And right. I've lost the working years of 32 to 37, which are prime right, right, right. working years. And I don't, I can't retire. I mean, I have to work. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But at yeah. least a, a sigh of relief. Yes. Over the last yes. couple of weeks, right? Yeah, it's a huge relief uh, just getting it behind me. 
Um, and I haven't been able to speak to many of my friends in the industry for several years. And so was there a gag order on you being able to talk to people or how did that, like, how does that work? Um, most people didn't respond to me. Um, uh-huh. I would reach out, uh, when they get together in the city and yeah, you're, yeah. They, uh, <laughs> you're, I think you're they, a poison pill. Yeah. I think what the compliance officers, they probably, I, I imagine my friends had to tell their uh, employers mm-hmm. that they knew me and my name was in the press and. Right, like is this guy showing up with a wire too? Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, so I understood. I didn't have hold grudges. Like, why haven't you talked to me in five years? I, mean, uh-huh. I would probably have to do the same thing if it was another friend. Right, but you have the felony con- conviction. I do. Yeah, <clears> the <throat> scarlet. So, yeah. Right. So yeah. you have to figure out a way to, you know, move forward with that. And right. uh, I want to get into that, but let's take it back to the beginning. Like, I want to. I want to understand how this all began. I mean, you, you're, you know, as I understand it, you were raised in relatively middle class circumstances. You were able to get a uh, scholarship to Wharton, right? Did uh, you do biz school and undergrad as one program? One program, right. right. I, w- I received an ROTC scholarship, which is the only real way to get a mm-hmm. scholarship at Ivy. Um, and so I uh, went to the Wharton undergraduate program, um, you know, good student in high school, had the grades. Grew up where? Uh, outside of Atlanta, uh-huh. uh, in a county called Gwinnett, like northeast of Atlanta. It's a pretty sprawling metropolitan area. The traffic's terrible. Uh-huh. Uh, my father worked for Coca-Cola. Uh, mm-hmm. My mother had a daycare center in our home. Just middle-class lifestyle. Uh, played soccer. I had two younger brothers. We were all soccer players. Uh-huh. Um, it wasn't good enough to play at Penn. I could have walked on, but then I looked at doing that my freshman year, and then the rigors of the academic load Right. It wasn't worth it. I was going to be playing in MLS or anything. So. so it's like a hybrid business school undergrad program? It is the business. It uh, is. So you it, go right into B school, right, like right well, out you of high go school. Into, you get a BS in economics, and you concentrate in finance or accounting or whatever. Uh-huh. So it's a, it's a bachelor's. So you knew you knew when you were a kid you wanted to go into finance, yes, like investment yeah. banker. Right, like, right. Know, I was yeah. always reading uh, three newspapers every morning. Right. You get USA Today. <laughs> You're one of those guys. One of those Alex P. Keatons. Uh-huh. I, was just gonna, uh, I was trying to remember his yeah. name from, from yeah, Family Yeah, yeah. I didn't wear the suit. Yeah. To school, I didn't want to be hanging by the flagpole, but, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, no, I was just really into it, following it. And uh, what do you, where, where do you think that came from? Um, I don't know. My my grandmother was uh, a stock picker. She uh, got into it in the '60s and '50s, and mm-hmm. uh, I talked with her about the market when I was uh, a child. And were you like trading when you were in high school? I wasn't. No, no, uh-huh. just but I would just follow it. Um, and then so when I got to senior year, the Wharton School is the top business program and that was mm-hmm. my reach school back you know in the 90s you, you applied to three schools and right so yeah yeah that was the reach mm-hmm. and um i got deferred and got waitlisted and i kept peppering the admissions officer with all my ap scores and sat twos and all mm-hmm. that stuff and saying it's my top choice and we had no way to really pay for it and then the the rotc scholarship came over mm-hmm. and so that that kind of worked it out. What do you have to do to, like, you have to, you have to be, what is being in the ROTC involved? So it was uh, one day a week um, of a class, and then there was a uh, drill a couple hours after that. Uh-huh. So it was like one Friday, I had to go to another university in Philadelphia, uh, St. Joseph's, mm-hmm. and uh, do that every, uh, every Friday for four years. And then do you, are you in the reserves after that? Or so like- what happened was, um, it was 1999, I had uh, done an internship, um, actually with Donaldson, Lufkin, Jen Rett in 1998 uh-huh. in the summer in L.A. They were the ballers. Yeah, yeah. It was the ex-Drexel Lambert guys, right. the guys that didn't get caught up in all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah, if you're familiar. Um, of so I got that summer of 1998 internship. It was like we were going out every night. It was a great. Right. And you're in the thick of it there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not that L.A. is the center of finance, but DLJ yeah, but in that, L.A. Was a, was a major DLJ situation. DLJ L.A. was pulling <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. They had a couple of... Uh, were you, was that Century City? Yes. yes in I the worked, Fox Plaza? I worked in the Fox Plaza. Did you? It was the Nakatomi Towers. What, year, right? what, what year was that? <laughs> uh, I was there in the summer of 98, and I started working there in the fall of 99. We were there. We were working in that building at the same time. Were we really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was a lawyer at Christensen Miller. In 98 uh, and 99. Yeah, 98, 99. I was there yeah. every day working. I lived in uh, Westwood. Uh, 24th floor, I think. I can't remember. Where, what floor yeah, I, I don't yeah. remember the floor I was on, but uh, I uh, I graduated Penn. I bought a Jeep and drove out to L.A. and uh-huh. lived in Westwood there at UCLA. And I just been gone. That's what Penn everybody does when they're, new, when they're new to L.A. They think like, Westwood's oh, a place a real to live. College. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was shacked up in the library. <laughs> uh-huh. This is the way to live. So I lived in Westwood, but I didn't see any of it because that, you know, that program in investment banking is 100-hour work weeks or more. And right. 
Uh, you're not you're twiddling your thumbs during the day, and at five o'clock in the afternoon, the managing director says, "I need this in my chair in the morning." Mm -hmm. And so you're there all night. That's cranking. the life, man. Yeah. I bet yeah. you we rode the elevator at the same time. At Probably, some point, you know. Probably, that's yeah. a trip. Yeah. So you do that, and uh, you're setting your sights on Wall Street. Yeah, getting to New York at some point in my career, and then uh, January 2000, um, I get a call from a friend who's at a hedge fund, which is a small investment firm. Um, in Greenwich, Connecticut, saying they're looking, uh, and this is at the time, January 2000, the NASDAQ is going crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, the valuations are very frothy in these um, toys.com and pets.com and right. rights.com. So when I came back after the, the summer first of bubble. Yeah, the first, the summer of 98, everybody I came back to work with in the fall of 99 was gone. They were all at the dot-coms. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know as many people there. And Got this call. It sounded pretty sexy. Cover technology stocks at this hedge fund that was growing in Greenwich, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And so in January 2000, I flew from L.A. to Greenwich, Connecticut, and it snows everywhere. I don't know if I made the right decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, but it's something I wanted to eventually get to in my career. And so I figured at 22, uh, why, not, why not start? And that was Lenexa? Uh, that was called um, Blair Asset Management. Okay. It was a small fund. So that's your more. first job? like First job, board. like picking stocks, yeah. Right. I was invested banking just for a few months. Uh -huh. So came over to start picking, uh, to, to get trained to pick technology stocks for this firm. Um, so I worked there uh, a couple of years, um, spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where all the companies are. And, right. Um, developing relationships there. Um, doing... Uh, fundamental research. Um, when you pick a stock, a technology, you want to talk to the customers, the suppliers, mm -hmm. the competitors, and develop um, a view on the stock. Do you want to own it or do mm -hmm. you want to short it? Because in the hedge fund, you can be short or you can be long. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that. Um, so like boots on the ground research. Yes, guy. exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, um, right. Like kind of what I learned in school and um, fundamental analysis, they called it. Not not trading technical analysis, fundamental um you know, Peter Lynch is a name for the, uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, and so that was in 2000. That firm closed in 2002, but I bounced around between other firms that were similar, 2003, 2004. So in my 20s, I, I had the same type of job at different firms. Right. Um, and then I got up um, into 2006, um, and a friend of mine was starting a fund, uh, Lenexa, and... Um, said, you know, do you want to come join me as a partner? And so mm -hmm. I said, sure. You know, I, I you know I had partnership anywhere before, and I was coming in my late 20s, and I had several years of experience, and this is a great opportunity to, to see something grow, and maybe this would be my my job I could hold until retirement. Right, right, right. right. Well, you're getting in at the – this was just beginning, right? right so you get right. on the ground floor. Right. Um, so just walk somebody – walk walk the audience through what a hedge fund is and what a hedge fund does just for the lay person. Right. So a hedge fund um, is a pool of uh, capital um, from investors that can be institutional or individual. Um, the hedge fund can um, – Invest. It's different from a mutual fund because not only can it buy stocks, it can short stocks, which means you bet the stocks uh, shares of a company are going to go down. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in theory, no matter what the market does, as long as you're owning the right stocks, you're betting that the right stocks are going to go up, and you're betting against the the right stocks, you're betting those are going to go down. You should be making money, mm -hmm. whether the market's going crazy or the market's tanking. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, because that's a it's a I guess viewed as a higher skill set than a mutual fund, the, the funds that the, that the firm can charge are, are, are higher. The, per, the profit percentages are higher. Right. So the hedge fund would keep 20% um, of all profits and 80% go to investors. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets pretty lucrative based on how many assets you have, um, how much um, you can return, and then you take your 20%. And this is why, yeah, so you're, you take your 20% no matter what. Right, right. right yeah. So it's, that's pretty good. Right, well, you and take your, uh, it's 2% <laughs> management, which is charged on the size of the fund, and 20% uh -huh. if you make money. I gotcha. So if you're a big firm not making money, you're still taking your 2% on your, your assets. Right? Got you. Right. And so this is why suddenly there's this massive proliferation right. of hedge funds yes, everywhere. Yes, money was going into hedge funds like crazy in the last decade, and by 2005, 2006, with housing going, that asset class was really uh, on fire. And you could get into a hedge fund. Um, it used to be you had to have a million net worth, and then it even became like you could get into a fund of funds that would invest in the hedge fund if you didn't even have that. So mm -hmm. 
there was a lot of money going into it. Right. So there's, there's, you would invest in, like if you're an individual investor, you could invest in a huge fund and that fund would then invest in a variety of hedge yes, funds. Yes, they would pick right? hedge funds for yeah. you, right? So you get hit with fees twice. So <laughs> <laughs> you have to... Okay. It's like if you're an individual, it's like leasing a car. You're getting right. screwed either way, right? right? Exactly. And and what distinguishes one one hedge fund from another, other than the size of the fund? It's it's just the the managerial team, right? The managerial and, team, and what they're deciding to place their their style of in. investing, um, how they do their research. But it becomes tougher to distinguish yourself and grow as we learn because there's so many funds. And so if you meet with a potential investor, they say, "Well, what is your what is your edge? What do you, what can you?" You own Apple. What do you know about Apple that nobody else knows? I mm-hmm. mean, this is a multi. This is one of the biggest. This is the right. biggest technology company. What can you tell me that nobody else knows? And, mm-hmm. and how do you answer that? Well, we think we're you know thematic investors, and we think Apple is the tech stock to own for the next ten years because of, they've get, they got mobile right. They're going to get wearables right, um, and we invest, and we think that they're going to earn this much money in five years, and the stock's only trading here, and they have this much cash. So you try to justify it based on your fundamental research. Mm-hmm. Um, but that fundamental research is what's accessible to everybody. Yes, yeah, so right? it gets a little trickier. So really you have to put up consistently good returns. And uh-huh. if you do that for a, for a few years, um, most people are going to stop asking questions. And Right, but know. when you first begin, you have to build that trust somehow, right? right? right. So you need at least one big investor who's going to say, I'm going to take a bet on these yes, young exactly. guys, right? You and so you become like this, that what, what was called one of the Tiger Cubs. Right, you need a right? big anchor. And they're... Um, uh, Julian Robertson started Tiger. This was a big hedge fund, uh, started in the early 80s and became a big uh, fund through the 90s. Tiger management. Tiger management, mm-hmm. um, along with Soros management. Um, these were George Soros, Julian Robertson are billionaires <clears throat> now, multi-billionaires. And um, Julian started seeding uh, younger managers um, later in life. And so he wanted to just to find the next him or the next uh, guys that would carry the torch for him. And so... Right. He, we started off with 16 million. He gave us 15. Another individual gave us a million. So we had $16 million, but we did have him as our anchor investor. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we could go out to potential other investors and at least we got this guy. We got this guy for us. us. You've heard Uh of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. And so, I mean, 16 million is not, that's a small fund, right? Right, right. And and so you're this upstart. Fund and how large, you know, how large did it get? We got to 100 million in 2007. Uh-huh. So through um, capital appreciation and bringing in more investors, um, we had a great uh, 2007, as did many funds. And so what happens is a lot of these investors wait to see how you do, and then they put money in. Uh-huh. You know, at the end of 2007, right. uh, which is like buying a stock at the top, right? So right. So, so the first couple of, the first year and a half, year or whatever so this is good right like yeah, it's, it's good. A, you're like living your dream right a partner at mm-hmm. hedge fund seated by Julian Robertson um you know I'm 20 uh 8 years old and mm-hmm. this is kind of where I'm going to see myself staying and maybe eventually he'll give me some money from my own hedge fund and right maybe I'll just be doing this for yeah, you're you're, you're, you're very well positioned for right. like a really lucrative successful right, career right and are you married yeah, when did, yes when, I got married, uh, got married really in 2005 uh-huh. uh, I was like uh, 27 right um, but my wife um, we met in 2003 at a bar through mutual friends but uh-huh. uh, and she uh, she was actually a swimmer at Harvard oh wow yeah oh, yeah cool. so she's the real athlete of the family mm-hmm. I've just tacked on later <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Who is the coach there? Joe Bernal didn't coach the women there, did he? Uh, you know? uh, Steph, Steph Reed is the coach now and coached uh, my wife um, back in the 90s. Uh-huh. But I think, she just, I think she's been there 15 years. But I, I don't remember who the men's yeah, coach was. Yeah, it was Joe Bernal. I, I think he's still there. I'm not okay. sure. Anyway, um, but you, wh- what's interesting is that it seems to me, my impression from the limited amount of articles <laughs> on the yes. web about this is that you seem like overall you're a pretty grounded guy. Like you're yeah. not you're not like living the baller lifestyle, no, like no, getting yeah. some huge loft in Tribeca. And, no, you know no, what I mean, I like you're that. living in New Jersey and you're Saving, building your family. Yeah, you know? building family, not uh-huh. not balling in the club. <laughs> right, throwing dollars around no, the strip not club and stuff. No, no, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> but man. you must have like lots yeah. of you. You must have buddies. Do I mean? Yes. Talk yes, talk to yeah. me about like the culture of that world. Like yeah, a typical so hedge fund guy. They were going out in New York. Uh, multiple times a week. Um, pulling in, like, what, you know, what, yeah, is it, what does it in, look like? Uh, 
I mean, you know, 24, 25 year old guys pulling in a couple million dollars a year, maybe, right. or at least a couple hundred thousand. So they've got no, no kids, no wife. They're just pulling in big bucks for that mm-hmm. age and, and just throwing it just around throwing like it crazy. Around, traveling to Vegas. Let's go to Vegas this weekend. Right. Charter Vegas a plane. Next weekend, charter <laughs> a plane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's go to Ibiza. Like, how are you, like, are you just opting out of that or yeah, just, just around uh, the margins of it or? A little bit. Like I'd go to Vegas here and there if it was like a bachelor party for a good friend, go uh-huh. out. But I wasn't too much into that partying all the time and I was pretty serious about my work. And Right. Because it's like, you know, for most people, I mean, I have friends that are in this world, so I know a little bit about yeah. it, but I wouldn't say that I'm very well versed in it. And, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, our point of reference is Wolf of Wall Street, you right, know, or right, Wall yes. Street, what, what you yeah. see in the movies or what you see in television. Right. Like when you when you see something like that, like when you watch a movie like that, do you do you go, oh, it's not, it's not like that? Or do you go, yeah, like I can, you know, I know guys like that or I mean, not exactly like that, but like that. Yeah, there's guys like and, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's not I wouldn't say the average guy is like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, people are definitely I mean, at that age when you're making that kind of money. Right. They're just spending it and having fun, and it's going to last forever. And right. You know. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's sort of like when everyone balks at how Justin Bieber acts, right, but right, it's like yeah. throw that much money at any kid yes. that age and see what yeah. happens. You right. know what I mean? It's like people become, you know, a, a little bit different versions of maybe what they would be. They, they did. Yeah. You yeah. know, we're surrounded by grounded people or what have right, you. Right. Right. I had a, like a middle class upbringing. Um, a lot of the guys I met, you know, it's sort of like the prep school mafia. Oh, where'd you go? And I went to a good college, but uh-huh. I was public high school. And and so not being in that circle, I think I just wasn't into... Right, the pinky ring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're all right. Right, right, yeah. Uh-huh, interesting. All right, so, so where does it start to, you know, begin to unravel? I mean, at some point, you know, somebody enters your orbit and you make a regrettable decision right. uh, and cross um, a certain line. Uh, around 2005, 2006, um, I, I go to a lot of investment stock investment conferences. So what that means is um, a bank will put on a conference and bring their clients there mm-hmm. um, who are public companies, and they give their presentations, their PowerPoints, Q&A, um, and they have meetings with investors. And so you go there, you meet with the companies that you know, and then you're talking to them about all their businesses. And then at night, you're going out with your buddies who are also investors. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... 2006, really, at these dinners, people are talking about, oh, so-and-so is going to buy so-and-so next week. Oh, yeah, I know that one, but I'm going to play this other one. You know about this company is going to buy this one. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there and all year, 2006. I kind of can't believe that people are just doing it so blatantly and, and putting bets on um, takeovers and whatnot. And so I guess everybody kind of went to school together, and some people are investors, some are lawyers, but they're all... Kind of um, this cabal. Yeah, yeah. So all my buddies, like, uh, or he works at this technology company, and he gives me the numbers. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, well, what do you mean he gives you the numbers? Oh, he tells me the revenue and the gross margin and the earnings before it's public. Before it's public. Mm-hmm. And so some, you know, we play that one small, and we'll play another one big. And if you buy a stock big, sell some before the announcement, because that way, if the SEC calls you, oh, I was selling some. Like I didn't know that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I'm hearing right, as long as you don't play it too big and you mix it up with some other stuff. Right. Like, yeah. You no won't get flagged. That, yeah. Right. And if you do, at least you're saying, oh, I was selling it the day before. Or, right. Or, hey, you're only calling me about this big winner. Look at all these big losing trades I have. Like, uh-huh. what are you talking about? So. But clearly there's a lot of this information getting yeah, shuffled clearly around. Yeah, clearly it's over the, over it the seems line. And, a little bit like, you know, as, as someone on the outside looking in, like, it's easy to be kind of flabbergasted, like, really? But, you know, when you're immersed in the culture to just be kind right. of like, well, this is going on, right? Right. It's going on. I'm going to these conferences. I'm going to, with, to dinner with buddies in New York. Oh, what are you playing next week? I'm playing the takeover of this company buying that company. And I didn't, I was just sort of shocked that like, it was so blatant. Mm-hmm. But it's been going on at that point for the whole year, 2006. Um, funds are being started whose business models are just... <laughs> crossing the line and playing these deals. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like explain that a little bit. Um, Like uh, there were people in the industry managing small hedge funds who uh, became known for um, just playing, uh, meaning they were just placing bets on uh, either uh, certain companies' earnings announcements Mm -hmm. because they had contacts in those companies or they had uh, lawyer contacts who would tell them about uh, mergers and acquisition deals. 
and said they would play those, mm-hmm. uh, being placed place bets on the stocks. And so that was, if you looked at uh, a lot of the firms 2005, 2006, a lot of their big winners were illegal trades mm-hmm. uh, in this type of, uh, off of inside information. Right, and they're getting away with it. They're getting away with it. It's not being uh, prosecuted at all, as far as I could see. And uh, I think in the early part of the, the decade, the focus was maybe on boiler room stuff and mm-hmm. the you know, <clears throat> Long Island stockbroker and stuff like that, P- penny stocks. And it right, wasn't the, really wo- on this, the Wolf of Wall Street right, type situation. It, it yeah. wasn't really on this higher level, big hedge funds, small hedge funds doing all this. Uh, like moving huge amounts of money around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that was going on pretty blatantly all of 2006. Mm-hmm. The biggest analogy that I can think of is doping and cycling. Like there's a culture where this is just going on. And, you know, again, uh, to be the outsider looking in, it's sort of like shocking. But right. when you're in the middle of it, it's you could see how you're going to start to gravitate towards making that choice if that's what's going on around you. I mean, is that right. how you would characterize how it I think it that's pretty close. Like I was thinking steroids in baseball, same type of yeah. thing. Um, if you uh, were in high school, an AP calculus, and somebody said, hey, here's the answer to the test. You're not really looking to find the answers to the test, but somebody just gave them to you. Even if you're the most ethical person, you have the test the next day and somebody just gave you the answers. It's going to be hard not to mm-hmm. do something with that. So, um, yeah, having the answers to the test, doping and cycling or steroids in baseball. But there's a, like, I guess the difference between steroids or doping and this would be, you know, you could just be within a group of people and passively absorb something without taking any action. Like suddenly right. you've just overheard something and, and then you have this moral dilemma, like, well, can right. I, I could act on that. I just overheard right. this. I was at a cocktail party and I heard these guys yeah. talking about this. You have to take the action of acting on it, but you, you've come into that information passively. Whereas like, you know, taking steroids, that's a, right. that's a, you know, a conscious act that you have to take. So, but at some point you do take a conscious, like you, you, you do you remember like what was it like when you consciously said I'm going to take this step I'm going to step over the line like what um, was that Yeah, it was in 2007. So I was saying 2006 was getting pretty crazy with the stuff. In 2007, um, a woman who I had known through the industry was also an investor. Mm-hmm. Um, she was one of these people um, who always heard a lot of rumors, and so she would call me a lot of times with, you know, I hear, I hear a rumor about Intel's earnings are going to be good. You should be buying it. And sometimes she's wrong. And it's like, right. Rumi Khan. Is yes, that right? that's right. right. Uh-huh. Um, and so she called me one day and said, um, I'm hearing, uh, our, our, I'm being told that Kronos is going to be acquired next week for, I forgot the dollar amount. And that's a little different than, uh, Oh, I'm hearing, uh, this and that. Did you wait? So did you call her or she, no, called, she called you? Me. She called you. She's like this, she, she's like this intermediary, like a, an information warehouse for passing right. this stuff along. Right. She right? lives in Silicon Valley in Atherton, big house, <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, made a bunch of money. And so she is really plugged into those, that, that network of people. Um, and how did you initially get connected with her? Um, a mutual, uh, investor friend of ours several years before connected me with her. I had actually never met her in person, um, for five or six years. And so mm-hmm. we just talked on the phone. Um, and so she was always meeting with companies, meeting with her friends that worked at these companies, and trying to piece things together. Um, I mean, legitimately, most of the you know most of the time. But um, it got to the point in 2007 where she called me with the information about uh, this takeover, and it was very specific. But it was the first time, so I don't know if it's a rumor or mm-hmm. oh, you know, sure, okay, I'll buy a little bit. I mean, mm-hmm. who who would have the specific information and. She never had any information that specific. Uh, mm-hmm. And so um, my fund, we bought a little bit of shares relative to our asset size. It wasn't like we were saying, oh, let's make a big bet on this. Right. But do you do you kind of privately harbor this or do you tell your partners? No, I told my partner. Yeah, like, uh, uh, she call, she I spoke called, to her. This is what she's saying. So there's a saying. collective decision here to like act right. on this. Right. I hope maybe he would say, ah, oh, you know, right. I don't know. And he, and did you kind of have like a you know what was the mental calculus like were you aware like okay I'm I'm making this decision I'm making I'm, this I'm, decision this is moral dilemma that I'm gonna fall into the I'm gonna sort of take a step into the dark side yeah you know? it was like that um, hearing all those guys in 2006 bragging about these big trades and they know this and that hey finally like you know Tom doing the real fundamental work talking to customers suppliers that's all mm-hmm. 
you know, finally that's, I'm getting one of these. That's for chumps. Yeah, I'm getting one of these, the hot ones. And so there was some... Like, finally, you're on the team now? Yeah, I'm on the team. So, like, if I see these guys again at dinner, hey, did you guys hear about this one? Like, mm-hmm. oh. Uh, and so, yeah. So there was that decision. Um, there was, I mean, when you, like, so when you go home that night, knowing that that trade's happening, like, how does that... Like, is it, are you just cool with it or is it like creating some dissonance for you or like, how does that, how do you emotionally kind of process that? Or is it just be, it just is, you rationalize it. This is the way the business is. That was the first one. So it was just rationalized and maybe mm-hmm. it's a rumor. Maybe, uh, nothing's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time saying, Hey, it's my turn to take a few crumbs off the table. Um, you don't really think about it as, Hey, I'm going to come in a felony. Like. There's no, there's no victims. The victims are the public. The investing public doesn't know this. So, but there's not really. It's not a white collar crime where oh, I'm going to like bilk these guys out of their mm-hmm. money. Like it's not. Yeah, there's there's, there's arguments that you can use to rationalize it. Yeah, exactly. And it's, and the idea of like, hey, if I really want to play in this field, like I've got to step it up. Got to do this. Yeah. Right. So got to do some of these. And and so how much money did the fund make off that trade? Uh, that one we. I think we made like half a million dollars, wow. which on a hundred million dollars, um, 0.5%. So mm-hmm. it's not, I mean, it was a good trade that day, but it's not something we needed to do because 2007 we're doing, we're doing well anyways. Uh, right. But so we made, I mean, a decent, decent chunk of money, um, there. And so, and now you're in, now I'm in, um, and Rumi says, Hey, this guy uh, that gave me the information, I gave him your cell phone number. He wants to get paid. <laughs> and then I know, mm. You did what? Oh my God! You gave this. So you're not paying. No one's paying Rumi, but she wants to pay her sources. Yeah, he wants to get paid. Uh, I think ten thousand dollars is good. Could you write him a check? I'm going to write him a check from my bank account to some guy I don't even know. Then I know I'm really like, this is way overboard. Right. Like, oh my God! Like, I can't believe this is happening. Uh, But then I'm already in. We've already played the stock and. Uh And if you so the the implicit understanding is if you want this channel of communication to stay open, you got to take care. She's saying you got to take care of right. This guy's going to have a few more for us, I think. Mm -hmm. So let's get them. Let's let's get them going now, and he'll 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 have a few more. Um, So what do you do? So get cash out, or what? I had shared um, this information with another friend at another fund, and I asked him, "Do you think you could get some cash together from my source because he's going to have a few more for us?" So I was kind of the intermediary. Mm. So it wouldn't, and nothing would be coming from me. Uh, and my friend got cash together. He worked at the trading desk where a bunch of traders had made money, and they said they threw it in the, past the hat. Um, they got ten grand. And then this guy, Rumi's friend, is going to be in New York. He texts me, meet me at so and so corner, and it's sort of I, I have the envelope, and I don't look at him. And are you Tom? And I hold it up. Uh, and he just takes it out of your hand. You're on a street yeah. corner in New York, right? Are you Tom? Wow. Hold it up. There's the money, and I, I kind of try to disassociate myself from it. Like I'm not really doing this. Like uh, I don't know. Like this isn't me. But I, I, I'm right. playing the game now, and so right, right, right. I'll, I'll give him the money, and uh, maybe maybe he will just go away and not uh, not give us anything anymore. Maybe this will be it, and I'll just take a shower and mm-hmm. be it. Yeah, uh, you know the human ability to rationalize, you know, behavior is profound, right? Right. Like you've already, you've already did it. You've got to get through the day. This is what's happening. And to disassociate like who you are from the action that you're taking is the only way that you can kind of live with the behavior. Right. 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 Yeah. So interesting. Um, you know, this interview came together like sort of super last minute and, uh, uh, so I didn't read up as much as maybe I could have. I mean, I, you know, I know your story, but I'm remembering, uh, maybe I'm totally wrong about this, but I believe there was a Vanity Fair article like a while back that, that Rumi, it was about oh, just yeah. kind of what's going on in hedge funds and about, I think there was stuff about this case in particular, the Galleon case in particular, right. but I believe there was some stuff about Rumi and what she was doing. Maybe I'm there wrong. There was something in uh, the New York Times it. Weekend magazine a few weeks ago about uh-huh. like what she's up to. She went to prison for a year um, and what she's up to out of prison. And my name was in there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, from what I understood, the the FBI had approached her around 2007 um, with a list of names, and she was instrumental to their prosecution of the Galleon Group, right? Um, which yeah, was the yeah, big yeah. billionaire they yeah. were going after that they put away for 11 mm-hmm. years. 
she happened to only be talking to this billionaire, me and another guy. I was on a short list, and I'm a no, nobody compared to... Right, so you're probably assuming she's she's making all kinds of calls to every like all right, you're just a everyone. small fish in her little network. Like I don't want to know who she's talking to. It's better not to know. And I come after um, all this happened. I come to realize she's really not talking to too many people. So when they're trying to get leverage on Raj Raj Ratnam, Rumi Khan is feeding him information on a few stocks. Who else is Rumi Khan talking to? How can we get leverage on her? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's this guy Tom Harden. Like mm-hmm. who is this guy? Right. So yeah. that's how it all begins. For right. You. But back to, you know, kind of the timeline. So you do this. So the Kronos trade is the first thing. And right. then from it just goes from there, right? It goes from there. The next one is um, Hilton, July 4th, 2007. Right. So they were, they were going to be acquired by Blackstone, Blackstone right? Right. Um, so, so you come into that information right. for, through Rumi again? Through Rumi. Uh, Hilton's going to buy Blackstone. Uh, Blackstone's going to buy Hilton. Mm. Um, July. It's going to happen July 3rd at this price. And so at that point... I'm thinking of how can I justify this trade if the SEC ever calls me about these trades. So I'm looking, I'm looking at options activity. Sometimes the options on the stock start, uh, people start buying options because they know something or nothing's going on. The day, July 3rd, an analyst um, from a bank puts out a report saying Hilton could be a good takeover target because it's cheap. Mm-hmm. And I tell my partner, we can buy this stock. You can stock. hang your hat on that Yeah, article. this is a report right. and it's actually going to happen tonight. Like it's going to happen before the like the holiday tomorrow. Mm-hmm. We can buy all we want today because this report's out. Thank God we have it, like a cover. Mm-hmm. And so he agreed, and we bought Hilton. And but you went large on that one, a little bit bigger because we had had uh, the information. We had gone through the Kronos trade, and okay, Hilton, we know it's legit. How much time in between these two trades? Uh, Kronos was in March, and Hilton was July. Uh-huh. So a couple months. Uh, and uh, we went bigger in that one, and we had this cover. There's this analyst report. Uh, if we ever got called by the SEC, because we had heard in the past that funds uh, who have questionable trades usually get like a nice phone call from the SEC. Hey, could you call us back and talk to us about this? Okay, let's get our cover mm-hmm. ready. And mm-hmm. as long as you can show them your profits and like, hey, you guys aren't asking me about all these trades I lost money on. Hey, I I lose money, I make money. You mm-hmm. can call me about my winners. Look at my losers. And it usually passes if you can dance around it. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a cover for Hilton. Right. So like if the initial red flag goes up, you get that courtesy call. Right. You're organized about right. what Why are you buying Hilton? You're a technology hedge fund. <laughs> like right, right. Hilton's right. on a tech stock. <laughs> right. Why are you buying it the day before it's being acquired? Oh, this guy, you know, we might even, I think, I don't know if we did, but we, you might even buy Hilton Marriott. You might have buy all three or four public insured ones just to say, oh, we're making a bet. You, I got you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So the strategies for just hiding it or? You're constantly thinking of a cover. Mm-hmm. All right. And then after Hilton. Uh, was. Um, and you don't, you're not getting any of these phone calls. What's the SEC is not no, no, calling right. you. Yeah, no, it even just after happens. Even after Hilton. Right, no, it's um, radio silence. It's radio silence. You think silent. you're in the clear. Right. Uh, it's, it, everybody else is kind of doing their own takeover trades, my other investor friends. Everybody's just playing the game. It's 2007. Uh, we call it Merger Monday. You wake up every Monday. There's three or four mergers that we're negotiating mm-hmm. over the weekend. Um, it's just a pretty frothy time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next trade was um, the Google earnings announcement um, in July. Um, it was from a different contact of Rumi's. Um, she worked at an investor relations firm and um, uh, knew, uh, was privy to Google's um, revenue and earnings per share and knew the exact information. Um, so we, uh, Google was actually going to come up short of what Wall Street was estimating. Google was on, the stock was going up a lot because it was, internet was hot and all that. Mm-hmm. And they were actually going to miss their quarterly estimates, which never happened. Mm-hmm. So there was going to be a big short opportunity here on the stock. Um, so we shorted the stock based on that information, and she was correct. All mm-hmm. the numbers were perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I uh, bet against Google. The market went down the next day. Google missed earnings. Uh, we knew about it. Right. We made that trade. Um, so you're three for three. Right. And she had told me before that this contact wanted $15,000. Uh, she was going to be somebody else. We're going to have all our sources paid. We're going to have this other guy, this woman. And so, so it's really like this network is forming of right. how you're going to continue to be able to do this. You're creating systems around right. managing it. Right. And I'm kind of past the shock of giving out money to people. Like, okay, I'll you're tell getting, my buddy. You're just acclimating that this is, yeah. 
this no is problem. business as usual. You mind if I tell this, this guy, this trading firm, because they'll, they pass the hat and they'll give me the money and I don't have to write a check. And, <clears throat> mm-hmm. So I can just let them, they make their money and then pass it to her. Mm-hmm. Like, sure, no problem. Mm-hmm. So then I see... Uh, so Ruby. another envelope on the street corner? Or? Uh, I, I am out in California, <laughs> in Silicon Valley, at a tech stock conference room. He's there and... Here's the 15 in an envelope. Is it in his cash? Yeah. You're doing cash. Uh-huh. I'm actually, um, like, I'm on the plane going out to San Francisco. It's in my back pocket. It's 15 grand. I put, it didn't fit in my two back pockets. I had to put it in all my pockets and my jeans. Uh-huh. Go through security, fine. You have to put it in the bucket when you go through security? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, my God. No, no, it's in my pockets. What happened was, uh, so then I run to the bathroom, put it all in my carry-on. I'm going in. It's in a bank envelope. Going on the plane to San Francisco, excuse me, sir, we're just doing random uh, checks of bags. Like, all right, uh, if they find it, I, I'm, uh-huh. going to, I'm going to Vegas. I'm, go, I'm going to go to San Francisco. I'm going to Vegas, and that's why I'm bringing all this cash. Because mm-hmm. if you have over 10... You have to declare plane, it or something like that? I think you have to like declare that? it because it could be drug trafficking or whatever. Or, mm-hmm. or they could take it, I think, if it's over 10. Oh, wow. So there's 15. TSA is going through my bag. Uh, the lady sees the envelope. And she just keeps going and says, all right. She doesn't open the envelope. Oh, like, wow. Wow, yeah. So I get on the plane. Like, oh, and I'm thinking, what am I doing? Like, yeah. This is. I mean, is that, is that where, do you start questioning? Like, I mean, is there a moment where you're like, I got to stop this? Or you're just too in? You're I'm just gonna, too in. Just I'm kind of far. like, uh, I don't know if I'm like not having fun with it, but kind of like the clandestine, like moving the money and doing this stuff. Mm-hmm. It's got its claws in you. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, this, I'm not hurting anybody. Like, this is just something everybody else is doing. I justify it by, oh, it seems like everybody else is doing it at the time. And mm-hmm. uh, and no you know, no phone calls from the SEC. No, There's no indication it. that this anybody's paying attention. Tracked. No, it's not being tracked. It's July 2007, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, nothing's going on. All right. So how, how many more of these before we get to the point where this starts to unravel? There's one more. Um, so my buddy at the trading firm who I had been passing the roomy concepts to gave me one back in September. Uh, three com was going to be acquired by Bain capital out of Boston in September. Um, and, and so that happened. Uh, and, uh, that was the last one. Uh, so there was four trades Four. um, and so I think we bought half a million shares. It was a 3 or $4 stock, but we st- still made a good chunk of money on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was, uh, nobody had to be paid off for that. That was kind of a payback for the other three. Mm-hmm. And then that was it, September, October 2007. Those four trades are done. All so, successful, all profitable, right. every time Rumi's on point. Right. And, and, and so your fund ends up... Uh, coming out of this like 1.7 million. Right. 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 Uh, and how much of that are you taking home yourself? Uh, 3%. So whatever that, uh, uh, whatever that is a couple hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, cause of the 20%, um, I had, uh, 15% of the 20%. So 3% of the overall mm-hmm. profits. Um, uh, so that, that was the compensation for that year. Right. right. And are you looking over your shoulder thinking like any moment this is going to come apart or are you thinking, Oh, this is, this is like, you know, easier than I thought. Um, it's easier than I thought. Uh, we had a big Christmas holiday party at the 2007, seven to celebrate the firm. I got, I got a couple toasts. Uh, we had uh-huh. a great 2007 and, uh, it wasn't until, uh, I believe it was January, 2008 where I got a call from Rumi. Um, saying that the SEC had called her um, about uh, one of those trades. I, I don't remember which one. And uh, what do you think we should tell them for a, a cover story? Hmm. At that point, I'm starting to get a little nervous. Cause, uh, right. Why would they call her about something that you did? Right. right. They must be putting the pieces together. Right. Are they you know called I mean? her? Why would they call an intermediary who who on her own was not making any trades unless they were on Well, the, she was trading information. She, she, was, she, she had her own account, right? She didn't have a fund, but she had her own personal stock account. So she was trading all the stock okay. she was packing to me. So she said the SEC called her about trades she had placed. I see. A, one of these four trades that we had done, she had received a phone call, and, and then uh, she was asking me, um, you know, hey, they mentioned your name, and... Uh, you know, what should we tell them? Like, what would be our cover story? And 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in New York in a few weeks. We should meet up and figure out what to tell them. And so I immediately get to work. Um, We had the cover story for Hilton and then uh, kind of tried to figure out what would the other cover stories be for Kronos and Google and 3Com. And uh, I got something together. I don't know if it was um, analyst reports or I believe Kronos was going to be talking at a stock conference a few days after we bought, so we could say, mm-hmm. hey, we were buying it because we thought they would sound good at the stock conference. And, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had something put together when she came to New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, she said, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. They're just asking me about these trades. Like, uh, you know, what should we tell them? And at that point, I don't know if she's wearing a wire on me or what's going on. I'm not even thinking about the wire thing because I, mm-hmm. I haven't been approached by the FBI yet. And, uh so she's just asking me uh, what she should tell the SEC. And so I, I tell her, you know, what I think she should say. Here's our cover, cover stories. And I'm starting to get pretty nervous because it sounds like she's not in a good situation. And mm-hmm. um, little did I know, she only talks to a few people. So, Right. You're assuming she's talking to all kinds of people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you're starting to think this isn't good. This isn't good, but it probably won't get back to me because... Uh, she'll she'll be able to get out of this, and it's just the SEC, and she'll figure out what to say. Right. But, but now, but now you're starting to look over your shoulder a little, a little bit, bit more. Yeah, yeah. yeah in early 2008. I mean, uh, how does that? You know, does that start affecting your sleep? Like, how does that work? Uh, not so much. Yeah, I'm kind of nervous. I don't want. To, I want to do every trade by the book in early 2008. Just my own fundamental research. The market's getting pretty bad in the first quarter of 2008. Everything's starting to unravel. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're actually, as a firm, we're struggling just with our portfolio, and it's very stressful because of that. And then there's added stress of kind of looking over my shoulder. Maybe something's, uh, you know, what if uh, we were to get a phone call about what we say? and Right. So that's happening through the early part of 2008. And we're just not doing well as a firm, so mm-hmm. it's very stressful. And mm-hmm. um, you know, It's the worst market in 75 years, so it's the worst I'd ever seen. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and you're trying to play it straight now. Yeah, yeah, we're just sticking by. Uh, I'm just and your partners by. as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not looking for any more of these. Like, uh-huh. uh, Kind of feeling guilty about it, I think. And then you get the tap on the shoulder. Uh, so July... Uh, I think it was July 7th, 2008, a Tuesday. I remember, uh, I, the Tuesday after July 4th, um, I'm dropping my dry cleaning off. Uh, we lived at 55th and Broadway. Dropping my dry cleaning off, come back out. And then uh, somebody says, are you Tom? And I turn around. I see like uh, a man and a woman in dark suits. The badge comes out. And uh, yeah, like, oh, uh, the FBI would ask you a few questions. Can we just go in this Wendy's here and sit down? Mm. So I sit down with them. It's kind of like uh, a little bit surreal, like uh, my heart's pounding, starting to pound a little bit. And mm-hmm. Maybe they're just going to ask me about Rumi or something. Like it's not going to be mm-hmm. me. And uh, they start they're not to, arresting you. They're not no, throwing you in a car. Or anything. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk. Sure. But like, is it like the movies feds with the sunglasses? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, the dark trench suits. coats and dark suits. And, right. Right. You know. Dark suits. Uh, you know, flipping the wallet open FBI. I just want to talk to you about a few things. Right. Sure. Like, what do you want to talk? Let's talk about it. And uh, they start talking about, hey, we know where you were uh, last weekend. You were down seeing your family, uh, you know, your newborn nephew in Georgia. And uh, we know this and that. We know you know this person and that person. We know you did these trades and that. We can play it for you if you wanted to. We have your voice recorded. Scare mm-hmm. tactics. And then it's like one of those scenes where yeah. I could see their mouths moving, but I don't hear what they're saying. I'm just sort of looking, looking around. And did they have that, or that's just a tactic to try to? They had all that information. They had all that. Yeah, I don't know if they actually. They, they, they tapping your phone, or like? I didn't make them play what they had. I just believe right. that they had it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, their mouths are moving. I'm not really processing it, and sort of snap out of it. And they're talking about, you can either help us, or we can arrest you now. Um, you know, really laying it down on me. Uh, Say, hey guys, I'll help you. Like whatever you want. Like, yeah, this is all true. Like, I, right. I, I. So there's no like, I gotta call my lawyer. No, it wasn't any of that. Yeah, it wasn't like, let me get back to you. Can I get, can I get your card and call you in 24 hours? Like, I was just sort of in a daze. Their mouths are moving. I'm thinking about the last couple of months and year, and 
like, hey, I'll help you. Like, what do you need? Like, mm-hmm. uh, they talk about the big ring they're trying to, to bust, and I'll do what I can uh, to help you out. And they say, mm-hmm. oh, that's great. You know, that's uh, that's your that's the best decision you can make. And uh, well, it's certainly the decision they want you to make. Yes, exactly. Not right? the best, right? Because yeah. they know you're. <clears throat> they've got you over a barrel. You know. Yeah. They know what you were doing, but they're not right. really concerned about you. They're no. going after Raj. Right, right. right. They're going after Raj. So explain a little bit about like who Raj is and Galleon. Right. They uh Galleon Group was a big uh technology focused uh hedge fund. Um Raj uh had a lot of investors who worked in Silicon Valley. Um and so uh he was uh had the reputation to be someone who would get maybe better information about companies because he had investors who worked at those companies. So they were mm-hmm. incentivized to give him good information about their companies. And so they had a reputation of being one of these funds, maybe crossing the line and probably were under the, uh, I'd imagine were under the regulatory radar for years just because of those, those relationships. And mm-hmm. because of um, some of the trades they had done were, uh, you know, in these big takeovers. And, but I don't think, I guess they were never really able to nail them on anything up until then. Right. And it, it, what's going on right now <clears throat> in in uh, kind of law enforcement in New York City and the SEC and everything like that is that you have a highly motivated U.S. attorney, right? right? Like Preet Bharara right. is like all about it. Yeah. Like this is like the mandate. These are cases like, they can win. Yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and trying to clean house yeah. in the securities industry is right. like a, a major sort of focus of this U.S. attorney, Right. right. That's right. Yeah. So it's kind of like whatever you need, all the resources, you know, at yeah. this U.S. attorney's disposal to like make all this happen. Yeah, they had started working on Operation Perfect Hedge, two thousand six, I think, um, and uh, they had been hearing about these this type of inside information going on, but they needed um, cooperators to wear uh, wires so that they could wiretap phones. It's very hard to get permission to wiretap the phones mm-hmm. and. So they were looking to use mafia type tactics to to bust this ring. Um, they, I guess, at, at first wanted to maybe send an undercover agent to work at the funds, but the funds are so the relationships are so tightly knit that you can't mm-hmm. really put an agent in there like you could maybe in a boiler room. Mm-hmm. Um, like it just wouldn't work. So they needed cooperators, smaller people that they could um, scare and then get to wear a wire and then get permission to wiretap the phones. Right. So that's where you come in. This right. is what they want you to do. Little fish. Right. So you have this meeting with the FBI. I mean, how long does this meeting go for? I think it was like an hour, but oh, was it? it seemed like all day. Yeah. And then like, so they're like, okay. And then the meeting's over. Like, and what are you sitting at Wendy's by yourself? At like, Wendy's. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to the office. What are you going to do now? Yeah. So I walk out, like I almost stepped in front of a cab. Like I'm I just sort of delirious. Like, do you call your wife? I mean, I just go to the office. Um, mm. cause the market's about to open at nine 30. My partner's probably wondering where I am. Um, so I get in a little bit late, sorry, this and that, whatever. Um, and so I have this business card and I'm supposed to call them back to me so that they make sure that I'm going to be a cooperator and help them out. So I think about it. I don't tell, I don't tell anybody. I don't tell my wife. Um, later on I was told I could tell like my wife, my therapist, my priest, but that's it. You know, um, which uh, I didn't tell her till later. Um, so I decided, uh, let me call them and tell them I'm fully on cooperation. It seems like this will be my best chance to stay out of jail. I don't know how this is going to go down. I don't know how big it is. Mm-hmm. They don't really show me the names. I just see a big ring. They show me and like, okay, I, I can probably... And you don't me. try to negotiate at all and say, look, I'm going to help you out, but you got to make sure that, you know... I'm taken care of, or I'm no, going to, you know, you're just, you're just all in and you don't even call a lawyer. You know, you're not bringing a lawyer into this no, equation at all. I, I hired a, that was, um, I was approached in July, 2008 by the FBI. I hired a lawyer in May of, or April of 2009. Mm-hmm. My lawyer couldn't believe that I had cooperated for a year without any legal counsel, which yeah, I think it's actually highly, highly me. unusual, but that, that may have played into, you know, everything. I mean, by all accounts, you were, you know, extraordinarily cooperative and that really determined, you know, the right. sentencing. Right. Yes, that's right. So it actually helped not to uh, to cooperate. Would you also, recommend that to the <laughs> erstwhile listener who's expecting a tap on the shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> For you up and coming yeah. uh, insider traders, yeah. you might want to take 24 hours to consult an attorney just because uh, we, we maybe could have spun this as, oh, 
Tom thought these were rumors. Like I wasn't actually talking to anybody at these companies. I was talking to Rumi, who's a rumor monger. Mm-hmm. But looking at um, right, if you, had you chose to fight this and say jail. arrest me, yeah. you know, yeah. if I had pled uh, not guilty, let's go to trial. I'd be personally bankrupt, uh, and I'd be in jail right now because the hit rate was 100 percent for people going to uh, trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the jury has just looked at these guys and said Wall Street's scum and blamed them for what happened in 2008 when really. Uh, these were cases I think that the uh, U.S. attorney knew they could win. They weren't going to go after the heads of the banks selling bad mortgages because you can't. It's harder to win. And right. So these were the faces. Roger Roger Adams, the face of the financial downfall, which isn't really. He was doing bad stuff, but it's not. It's, he's not the guy that caused the market to crash in mm-hmm. 2008. Mm-hmm. But it was cases they could win. I think so. Mm-hmm. All right. So suddenly you're an informant. Right. And you're harboring this secret. Your partners don't know. Your right. wife doesn't even know. I right. mean, what was the decision to withhold it from your wife? I mean, just uh, I needed fear to or shame it. or like... Yeah, fear or shame. Um, that first couple of days, um, I was just thinking how like upset my parents are going to be when they find out about this because I was the only uh, child of my of my cousins in the South that went to an Ivy League college, and look mm-hmm. what I, I threw it all away. And how would I tell my wife about this? Like... She doesn't know anything about these trades. I don't tell her in 2007 I'm buying Hilton, and I don't talk about any of that. Mm-hmm. So she's going to be shocked. Like, she knows me as straight-laced Tom, mm-hmm. just the guy she married, and it's going to be shocking. So how do I, I guess I'm thinking for a few weeks, how do I break the news to her? And i got to tell her at some point. i got to tell somebody. Right. Um, I went into St. Patrick's Cathedral a few days later and talked to a priest <laughs> and said, uh, this is what's happened, and... I forgot what he said, but mm-hmm. <laughs> but I needed to talk to somebody. I was having panic attacks, uh, waking up, shortness of breath at night. Uh, it was bad. It was, uh, I was thinking about maybe just punching out, like going to the top of the building and jumping off. Like mm-hmm. it was pretty bad. Um, I had struggled with depression in college mm-hmm. and it was coming back pretty, pretty hard. So, and to be, and to harbor that like alone without yeah. support yeah. is pretty toxic. Right. I was going to put, I was going to entrap my friends um, into telling me st- uh, legal trades they had done just to save myself. So for the mistakes I had made, I was going to go to colleagues and friends and make them tell me. Mm-hmm. You could go to anybody on Wall Street at the time and say, tell me about that trade that you traded illegally and somebody would tell you something and I could record it. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of unlimited how I could help them. Mm-hmm. And I felt tremendous guilt, tremendous regret. Um, and uh I had some really bad days where I'd go to the elevator and say, push the down button. I'll push the up button. Push the down button. Go down. Go to work. Just keep going. Mm-hmm. So it was it was tough for several weeks until I told my wife, and then that made it a little bit easier to talk to somebody about it. So what was that conversation like? Uh, it was a Friday night. Uh, I think we were going to go out to dinner. We uh, were just having a drink. And I said, so i got to tell you something uh, <laughs> about something that's been going on and just Mm -hmm. sort of set back and said the FBI approached me about some trades I did. Um, I'm going to help them out uh, across the line and I think we're going to be okay Uh, but um, to work with them I'm going to have to like take down some of our friends and uh, it's a really crappy situation but it's better than our family being separated so I'm going to put our family over this and hopefully I don't go to jail but I'm going to have to take down uh, some colleagues and people that have been friends for years and uh, it sucks it's like I don't know what what you do you don't mm-hmm. it's not like it was the mafia where I'm not a rat and I'm like I'll go to jail because mm-hmm. I'm not going to rat it's not I wasn't even thinking about breaking the law when this happened like it was I did but I wasn't like I got to decide friends or colleagues and our family or colleagues and mm-hmm. it's like okay I'll I'll do what you guys want me to do as long as it hopefully keeps me out of jail like and how did she receive that news? Actually, she was pretty understanding. Like, she wasn't, uh, she kind of processed it a while and said, you know, I would be really upset if it was something you did to me or something, but it's not really that. Uh, you really, you know, screwed up. But uh, we talked about it some more, and then she was just absorbed it much better than I expected. Mm-hmm. Um, I told the FBI that I told my wife, and they said, oh, you know, if we need to talk to her, let us know, because this is, just breaks up a lot of marriages. Said, no, it's actually, like, we talked about it a lot, and decided, like, it's the best course of action, like, in a bad situation, what to do moving forward. Mm-hmm. So 
I didn't have her, uh, or if she had reacted differently, it would have made it that much tougher. Yeah, I would imagine it does break up probably most marriages, right? I yeah. mean, she stood by you. You have two daughters, right? Right. right. That was before and, she was pregnant, so uh-huh. yeah, before we were before we were into and, starting a family. And just to put it into perspective, I mean, you're 32 when this is uh, going on. I was uh, thir- I had just turned uh, 30. I was about to turn 31. But wow, that July. So it's still beginning of my career, relatively. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're young man. And it's over at that point. The career's over. So I'm thinking, 31 years old, done. I got. I worked so hard my whole life, public school in Georgia, getting to this top school. I threw it all away in less than 10 years. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. But like an always an awareness that, that you that you were responsible for your own. Yes, undoing. that was my own downfall. Yep, I took full responsibility. I didn't blame anybody else. It was I made those decisions. And uh, there's other guys still working today that did much worse than I did. They're still working. That's just the way. I happen to know this lady who they were looking at, and she knew Raj, and I was just in that little group there. And right. So when you, fate. when you kind of look at the investment community or the hedge fund community, you know, how rampant would you say this kind of illegal activity It is? was highly rampant and the, the FBI was aware of it. And I could just say, give me a fund. I'll get you a, a guy, like whatever you, how, however far mm-hmm. you want this to go. And, uh, they were just trying to lever up on Raj, I think with other informants. So the ultimate goal is getting getting Raj, yeah. right? And so yeah. <clears throat> you're going to be like a ladder on the on right. the on the you know on right. the way up to getting him. So, so how does it begin? Like they pull you, or the, you you go over to the FBI and meet them. Like talk me through uh, like the you, actual process yeah. of beginning to wiretap so, okay, and, and um, do all of this. You know, we meet a few times. They get the whole story in all four trades. And it's kind of like. Do you a, go over to the FBI or do you meet them in like met, secret them outside, locations? Or? Uh, we just uh, sat, like it was a nice summer, uh, 2008. So we just sat outside under a table and, okay, boom, give me your life story up to where you did these trades. Mm-hmm. And then they said, okay, kind of like, whose head can you give us? How helpful can you be as an informant? Because they're kind of skeptical. I'm not plugged into some of these. Um, information mafias like maybe some other people are and uh, it was called the Indian Mafia clearly don't fit Mm -hmm. that role but I was somehow plugged into it so uh, they said who can you give us and so I thought about guys that I knew were doing this as I said before as like a business model like always doing this and so I felt I justified my cooperation and bringing them down a little bit by saying they're doing it all the time I did it four times if I'm going to lose my career over this I'm going to help the FBI at least try to rid some of the bad guys out. Right. Uh, they're doing it all the time. So I gave them a few names I thought I could wear a wire on, and we started that day um, with the first individual. And uh, the, the wire, is, it's not like the, God, the Godfather where it's all around your chest. It's a little like Blackberry battery. Yeah, so that's what I want to know. I want to yeah. know the actual, like, how does it all work? So uh, we talk about a situation to... Um, to get um, the target into a conversation about an illegal trade they did, which um, these were all people that were in the same trades as me, the, one of the four trades. So mm-hmm. we could rehash like um, when I told you about this and you traded on it. So uh, I'm already starting to get these people going in a conversation for something that I told them. <laughs> if they didn't know me, they wouldn't even be here. So mm-hmm. uh, in this conversation, so getting them in that conversation I need to get them to say that they knew it was illegal or knew that we had crossed the line. And mm-hmm. uh, the first individual friend. Um, not just that, not to just discuss an illegal act, but an acknowledgement. I need them to acknowledge that, it on the wire, yeah. And uh-huh. so. And the wire itself, is it like a little it's like, like taped on your chest? No, it's like a little, like uh, see remember like the little Blackberry battery rectangle things? You just drop it like in the pocket, shirt pocket. Uh-huh. You can just drop it in there. So oh, if it were wow. to fall out, oh, my Blackberry battery. Uh. Ah. Uh, so it wasn't like taped on the chest or anything like that. Interesting. Um, and it's like a transmitter, or is it actually recording it on on recording that it, device? Recording it on the device, mm-hmm. so they can play it back. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I met with the first individual that I knew that I told uh, some of these trades to, and got him into talking about it a little bit. He was very uh, quiet, like. And so my first time, they listened to it, and they said, Tom, like, you're talking nonstop. You have to let him talk. Like, I'm nervous, so I'm just filling in the 
I don't like the silence. Like I'm just filling it in the silence. Like you have to like, if he's going to be silent for a minute or two, just let him think about his answer and don't talk. So I kind of mucked it up a little bit the first few times, like I'm mm-hmm. uh, just getting used to it. I'm nervous doing this. And but you're put it, you put this little thing in your chest pocket, right. right? You go, you have the conversation and then you go hand deliver this device right. when to, I'm the done, FBI. to the FBI right? uh-huh. and, they listen and you have to some it. kind of drop arrangement or like how do you Just back into the they're usually in the car outside and drop it mm-hmm. off to them and see it see you tomorrow like what time should we meet and but they're not listening it's not transmitting so they can't be listening they go to, listen it to it they listen later. to it afterwards yeah, gotcha. yeah. and they okay. say kind of like how I did you know right. and I wasn't good in the beginning and they got better uh, mm-hmm. when I'm doing it a few times but at some point you get really pretty good at this yeah yeah. Right. Because I mean, you you're basically the work that you did is responsible for over two dozen prosecutions. Right. Right. So what I did, um, what I did um, specifically is I, I did this uh, type of wire conversation with maybe four individuals, but one or two of these individuals, when they were approached similarly to me, one of the individuals actually opened this. Um, uh, entire expert network network uh, of, of um, 20 individuals to the FBI. So I actually get credit for opening up this network to them because I introduced them to this person. So it's mm-hmm. not like the articles about me say I did all this <clears throat> stuff, but I didn't even like really know that that would happen until I talked to my friend who then knew. Who right. Panicked. So so basically, like you get somebody on record saying what they shouldn't. Yeah. And they bust that guy, and then they do the same thing with that guy that they do right. with you, they're, and they're, they're just inching at, their way up. Yeah, they look at this guy and say, can he help us, or should we arrest him? If he, if, if he can't help us, we're going to arrest him. He's going to jail. If he mm-hmm. can help us, we'll approach him like we did myself mm-hmm. on the street. And do you have, like, like two, like, sort of point people at the FBI that you're right. interfacing with? I right. mean, do you ever go in and meet with Preet, the U.S. Attorney's no, Office? No, or not until later after know. I hired a lawyer that I meet with the AUSAs and mm-hmm. – so I'm just interfacing with um, a few people in the FBI on the case. And uh, and meanwhile, you have no – you're not having any conversations about like, look, man, are you going to still prosecute me or like you – know, No, I'm not thinking – I'm not asking about the outcome for me. I'm just, you're just basically like whatever you need. Like, whatever you need. It's my second job. I'm going to be in California next week for a stock conference. I know this guy out there who trades on all this stuff. I can get him in a situation where he's going to tell me about a lot of th- – oh, they were on the plane with me, flying out with me to California. Like, this sounds good. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got an individual out there in a conversation about um, several stocks that he had traded illegally, people that he was talking to inside companies, their names, and also, like, how he was hiding money in some island or something. Mm-hmm. So I was talking to him for a while. We were in his car one night. I was asking him a lot of questions. He's like, Tom, are you wearing a wire or something? Like, why are you asking me all these questions? Mm. Is that the first time somebody yeah. sort of called you out a little? That time. Well, you think you were just getting too comfortable with this role? That I you think I was being a little like, less uh, careful? Yeah, I was just peppering him with questions about, oh, how do you... Because he knew that I had come to him with some of, some of the, inf- the trades in 2007. So Tom kind of like has his sources now too. And so I'm trying to get from him, how do you hide the money on these trades because I need to know for myself because I have these sources so I got to know in the future mm-hmm. how you do this and so I'm trying to learn how to do all the illegal stuff can you tell me mm-hmm. and he was kind of skeptical like why are you asking me all these questions like mm-hmm. so oh, I'm just wanted to know for myself did he shut down on you or did he ultimately no answer he ultimately them? answered them yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was another instance with an individual in New York um, the first individual who I wore a wire on who was skeptical it wasn't I wasn't doing that well getting information from him and so he lives in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, and then one Sunday, he's like, can you come up? Let's uh, grab dinner. Uh, can you come up tonight? And so I took the train up to Greenwich from New York. And he picks me up in his car and he says, uh, let's go. Why don't we go swimming? Uh-huh. I said, okay. He's like, let's go to my mom's house. She has a big house. So it's this big, empty, quiet house in Greenwich. Mm. He's got swim trunks for me. He's putting his swim trunks on. He's like, get changed. So clearly I, he wants to see if there's something strapped to my right, chest. Right, right. This and is so, all artifice to like figure out what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's skeptical, I think, of my intentions. And uh, he's like, get changed. I'm like, I'll go to the bathroom. He's like, no, you get changed in here. Like, mm. So I'm there like naked getting changed. I'm able to say, I got to go to the bathroom real quick, take it out of my pocket, put it in my shorts. Mm-hmm and get changed in the bathing suit. And then we go out 
in the swimming pool and throw the tennis ball. It's very awkward, very, like, I'm kind of looking around. It's a big, quiet house. Like, is there a ditch dug, dug or something or what's right, going on? Right, is he going to pull a gun on you or? Yeah, knock me out with a shovel or something or is it, yeah. Like, I'm feeling pretty, like, I, I never really felt like I was in danger until this point. Like, he seems a little crazy, this whole thing, and, like, we're in this big, quiet house and I don't know what's going on. It's going to the swimming pool. Is he, I don't know, like. So what's he, what is he saying to you? And then so out in the swimming pool, he's talking about, have you been approached by the SEC? I say, no, not the SEC. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, they don't tell him anything. And like, okay, so to make sure you're not wearing a wire, like stuff. Oh, it's cool, like whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, so I didn't record any of the conversation because it was back in my shorts. <clears throat> Is that like the scariest moment in the wiretapping career? That was, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, yeah. Uh, I was in other situations where I didn't feel like I was, talking with somebody i would have been scared i think to go up against a billionaire just because of their means but right that was the most scared i felt because it was just a really awkward day and wasn't sure what he was getting at and i could tell he wanted to see if i was wearing a wire yeah that uncertainty of not knowing like what exactly is going on like that feeling of being out of control right right and i would imagine at this time you know you sort of traded in this whatever dissonance you were harboring over making these illegal trades initially and you know, whatever kind of like moral consternation that caused you uh, for this new level of anxiety and stress of, you know, snitching on your friends and your colleagues and and also this, you know, idea of getting possibly caught doing it and the danger that that's putting you in. Right. And how is this starting to affect your mental disposition, your emotional life? It's still not good. Like, um, I'm not like having the, should I go up or down at the elevator thoughts anymore? I'm kind Mm -hmm. of past the suicidal thoughts. Like I'm doing this uh, I'm just telling myself it's gonna it's gonna help me in the end, um, and uh, but at the same time, it's just tormenting to know I'm getting these guys in situations that are gonna ruin their careers just like I did, and I'm bringing them down from mistakes I made, which doesn't seem right. But mm-hmm. and you can't really disclose who those people are, right? Right. You can't, yeah. you can't really talk about that, but but certainly you know this is what's happened, right? Like you have yeah. friends that you have now sort of devastated their lives right. as a result of this. They're I mean, do you, do you interact with them now? Like, do you see no. them? Do, is there any communication? There's nothing. I'm not allowed to communicate with any of those guys anymore. Right. Uh, there's an individual whose name came out later who I reflect on conversations I had before the FBI approached me who was really peppering me with questions. So I think he was the instigator, maybe wearing a wire on me. Right. But I don't, I don't feel... Um, and he well, or he had to do when uh-huh. he was in the same situation, I'm sure family or friends. Yeah. And like, he had to do what he had to do against me. And I had to do what I had to do against the other guys. And, and at some point it's, it, it becomes sort of public knowledge that there's this guy out here, you know, somewhere there's some guy who's ratting, right. Yeah. And he's called Tipper X. Right. And who is Tipper X? Like right. who's this mole? Right. Cause right? Like the next two guys are networks. going down all over the place. Yeah. And I mean, is there a concerted effort? in the community to like try to root this guy out. There I mean, is, is that yeah. what, is that what going to Greenwich was about? And you know, uh, how close do they come to figuring out that it's you? Uh, nobody really did. I mean, um, the Tipper X thing started in 2009 In October, 2009 Raj was arrested. And, uh, the how did, how, so how did it happen? How did it finally get up to Raj? I mean, it was a result of all of these people, but you know, ultimately, you didn't have any personal interaction with no, Raj, right? Raj. Um, I was able to help them out with Rumi Khan enough, I think, to get leverage on her that she could really give them the goods on Raj. And mm-hmm. um, I think there was other informants that worked on Raj when I understood it's... Right, but it wouldn't... I mean, Raj is not going down without the work that you did. Right, yeah, because one of the main people to bring him down was Rumi. Mm-hmm. And for them to get, really get Rumi to cooperate, they needed somebody else on her. So I was one removed from, from Raj that gotcha. way. And then my cooperation on this individual in California, another individual, opened up this entire insider trading ring. So if you look online, there's an infographic of like <laughs> who knows who. And there's the Raj, and then there's Tom I saw Hart, that. And Tipper X. And I saw that. I who published up. that? Because I remember seeing that along. Was uh, that in Vanity Fair? There was something. It might have been in Vanity Fair. Yeah, yeah I think it was, I think it was incredibly and, complicated. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was a big uh, ring, and so I was happy to be... And Tipper X is, like, at the middle of between, the... Between, yeah. Right. <laughs> between it all, right? I, right, right, right. Yeah. And, like, I was only talking about... Did that come out people. when you were in the middle of it, though? I mean, what was that like? It was afterwards. Open up, uh, okay, so... It was... Uh, I had started cooperating in July 2008, and then 
January 2010, it was Tipper X. We figured out who it is. And so I was given a heads up the day before that article was coming out. Um, every week there was a few names released. Mm-hmm. And they said, you're going to be the only name released tomorrow. So it's probably going to be all over CNBC. <laughs> you may mm-hmm. want to, reporters are going to be calling you, come into your house. But where does, when does Tipper X become like vernacular? Like everybody, people are talking uh, about Tipper October X. 2009, Rogers arrested. Um, the information is presented on him uh, by the feds, like how they think he's linked in this network. And then so some names are public, some names aren't. Mm-hmm. My name was still sealed at that point. So it was Tipper X. So gotcha. one of the articles said, oh, there's this Tipper X who seems to be very uh, important to this mm-hmm. uh, prosecution. And uh, who is Tipper X? And so that was from just from uh, October to January. Right. And then I got the word that my name would be unsealed um, in January 2010. And what is that decision about? Like, why did they have to unseal that? It was just part of, uh, I think, as far as who they were targeting for arrest that year. Um and what information needed to be made public. Um, it was just my time to be unsealed. Mm-hmm. And I think they felt like I had already done all I could. So, I mean, obviously I couldn't be unsealed if I was still wearing wires. So. Right. So we've, we've used you up. Yeah. We've gotten out of you what we're going to get out of you. Now right. it's time to arrest you. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. It's time to you know? unseal your name. Like, yeah. Uh-huh. Cause it, up to, to this point name. you weren't arrested yet. No, no, I didn't. I wasn't processed until, um, well, I was processed in December of 2009, so that was a month before my name became public, but that wasn't mm-hmm. really an arrest. I turned myself in. You get fingerprinted. You go through the U.S. Marshal's office. Um, you plead, uh, Your Honor, I plead guilty. Um, but turning yourself in, I mean, it's at some point the FBI says, you got to come in now? Yeah, like, you got to come in and be processed. Uh-huh. So that was just one day in December and, 2009. And, and you're not like, what do you mean? Come on, look what I did. <laughs> I know, you know, right, you're not yeah. going to like... I'm really going to still get the felony? Like, yeah, can't you just, I never. And they, they say, yeah, you're still, yeah, you're get, still getting it. Maybe you won't go to jail. That I mean, along the way though, are they saying, wow, you're really, you know, delivering the yeah, goods here. You're really like, doing a good job. Like, I mean, what is the, like, do you befriend these guys in the FBI? What's that relationship? Like, uh, like it's a weird, like Stockholm system. It is. So, yeah. Like yeah. sort of thing. Right. Yeah. They're saying doing a good job. Uh, what else you got? Uh, Mm -hmm. always pushing you. Yeah. Yeah. And so at some point after about four of these guys, uh, kind of said, I don't, I don't have anybody. I mean, I think I've done Mm -hmm. a lot. I haven't talked to a lawyer at that point to tell me, yeah, you've done. I can't believe you still hadn't talked to a lawyer at Uh, all. I just felt like it would be in my best interest. Is your wife saying, I think you should go. No, she's, uh, she doesn't want to know too much about it. I think she Mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, I tell her what I'm doing, but I don't tell her, hey, I wore a wire on this guy and that guy. Uh-huh. Just, I don't want to tell burn, her about Burn the her with that. Yeah. And then and, and did the FBI ever try to get you to go do something that just was too dicey where you just they, they had like a little bit the, of panic and like backing out of it? They evaluated all the um, potential risk of every person that would be wearing a wire on if it would be really risky, too risky to do. And so they had vetted that out pretty well. Mm-hmm. So they weren't going to make me uh, go sit with Raj or something and right. that uh, – I felt pretty comfortable other than the situation with the swimming pool, which is just awkward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was kind of like a second job. Like I joke with them a little bit about this and that, and, Oh, I thought I was going to fall out here and Oh, my neck was all red here. So maybe that person knew <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, you're having this collegial kind yeah. of relationship with these guys. Still going down, know, but like, it's like, right. Yeah. That's, it's a bit, so, yeah. that's, that's wild, man. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, um, still got my job through, um, July 2008 to February 2009. So I'm still going to the office. And there are no, they're none the wiser. No, they don't, nobody knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not doing well at work. Like it's a bad market. I'm not picking good stocks and I'm, I'm just, my brain isn't at work at all. Mm-hmm. So by February 2009, my partner's like, dude, you're not even like, you're not here. Like, I don't know what happened to you, but I gotta let mm-hmm. you go. Like, like I understand. <laughs> okay. And at that time, I kind of think my name could, could be coming out any day. So I'm like, uh, so you, so you let them f- f- let you go. Yeah, yeah. I was uh-huh. actually going to quit the day that they fired me. So I had actually packed up all everything Friday. Sunday, my partner sends me an email saying, "Don't come in Monday. You're done. Mm. We'll send you all the stuff home." And he's like, "Where's all your stuff? It's gone." <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we it was weird because I was going to quit that Monday. Just mm-hmm. uh, the fun wasn't doing well. I was so stressed out about this other thing I was doing and. Uh, I just felt like, uh, 
I couldn't handle going to work, not doing well. And right. So, so how much time between that and when all of this goes public? Like your uh, name gets revealed, you're arrested, all of that. Laid off February 2009, name is public January 2010, so almost 11 months later. So what's that day like? So they tell me the night before, um, the articles come out online that night, they're going to be in the print papers the next day, Tipper X unveiled Tom Harden, phones ringing off the hook, emails. Um, one of the reporters, I believe it was from the New York Times, uh, I had a family blog about we just had our daughter, so I'm putting up cute photos of my relatives in the South. Mm-hmm. He goes on and puts in the article, Tom's wife's name is this, his daughter's name is this. He's trying to get me to respond. Mm-hmm. It's pretty low. Um, and you, when, the, when your name went public, had you turned yourself in already? Yeah, so that was, I turned myself in December 2009, okay. and my name was public a month later. I got you. All right. So, but that morning, I wake up for CNBC, like I'm preparing for it. I already told, I hadn't told my parents, but I had told my um, father-in-law and mother-in-law. And so I see this news about this Haitian earthquake, and it's all Haiti earthquake, nothing about Tipper X. Mm. So it happened to be that day. So the news cycle saved you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was, uh, and then it was on the front of C1, a Wall Street Journal, Tipper X revealed, not Harden. Mm-hmm. So plenty of people read the Wall Street Journal, never saw it because they're not following the case. So mm-hmm. Tipper X uh, skipped the article. Mm-hmm. So only a few people actually in the industry even emailed me saying, saw your name or hope you're doing okay. Wow, that's surprising. A lot of people didn't even see it because if you're not following the case and my name is in the headline. Right. Yeah. But you got to pick up the phone and call your parents. Uh, I didn't. I I waited for a while. And unfortunately, the way they found out was my youngest brother was kind of skeptical of me being out of work. Um, So my daughter was born October 2009. And so I said, oh, my thing to everybody is I'm going to be a stay-at-home dad for a while, figure out what I want to do. My brother kind of skeptical. Oh, you, you know, went to Wharton and all this. Like, they don't think Doesn't you're staying at home. Up. Yeah. And so he's Googling me, finds the story, a Tipper X revealed, mm. sends it to my parents. And my mom calls me, um, oh, my God, because it says, like, he could go to jail for 20 years or whatever. It's maximum. Like, I'm sure this is tearing up your marriage. I'm so sorry. Like, not the way I wanted them to figure it out. Mm-hmm. I guess I was hoping that they would never find out. Right, but that's like that's denial at its yeah, finest. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to tell them. I kept saying, next time they're here, uh, they were divorced, but they would each visit twice a year to see the baby, and I'll tell them in person. I don't want to say it over the phone; it's easier to explain in person. Mm-hmm. But it's that thing where where the longer you wait, the harder it becomes, and right. then eventually they find out the wrong way. Yeah, so because that's you like two thousand. Couldn't, you couldn't they find get out. it together to actually just do it, right? And let them know, like over a year after my name was public, that they, right. they find out. Like, but that sounds pretty understanding from your mom to say, you know, I'm concerned about your marriage, as opposed to like, how could you do this? Yeah, and, like I saw, like you're mm-hmm. going to go to jail for a long time because <clears> she <throat> sees, ah, uh, Tom could go to jail for twenty years because it's two counts and. But yeah, like I'm so sorry you guys had such a great marriage. Like I can't believe it's going to be torn apart. And right. So I call her back and kind of have to explain the situation. And I'm so sorry I didn't tell you before. I didn't want to worry you like this. And um, and my and then I said, please don't tell Dad. I'll tell him when he comes. He's coming in a month to visit. I'll tell. I want to tell him in person. And she's like, I had to tell your dad. I'm like oh God, like mm-hmm. not the way I wanted it to go down. Mm-hmm. And so I call him, and uh, it's, he just doesn't understand, like, how this could have happened, like, how, how I could have crossed the line like that. He's not mm-hmm. the boy that he raised, and, like, he's pretty upset. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's over the phone, too, so it's really hard to explain. And, oh, but everybody was doing it, Dad. Like, come on. Like, right. Yeah, now he doesn't understand that. Like, uh, um other friends of mine are just shocked that I'm involved in this. Like, it's like, doesn't make sense. Like Tom's like picks the stocks fundamentally. Like, I can't believe you went overboard. And what do you, uh, like discern from that in terms of, you know, how human behavior works? Like if you can look at yourself and say, you know, I didn't think that I was somebody who would make that choice. And, and my friends and my family members didn't think that I was somebody who was capable of doing that. Like, what is, you know, what is the lesson or what is the forewarning? I think anybody is capable of it. Uh, anybody in my shoes at that time that uh, was getting caught up uh, and seeing everybody else make these trades in 2006 and kind of wanting a little bit of, uh, I kept 
call it telling to myself in my head, I'll scrape some crumbs off the table. It's not going to hurt anyone. Like, it's a crime, but there's no victims. Like, even at court sentencing, the judge asked the prosecutor, are there any victims? Uh, no, Your Honor, there's no victims. Like, you sort of think, well, this is a felony with no victims. Is there mm -hmm. anything else like that? Like, other white collar crime made off, there's victims. But, wow, okay. But it is in this country. It's felony. And, uh, I think anybody, you know, um, a few people have told me or I've heard people tell other people like, oh, I would never cross that ethical line or I think you don't know until you're there and what you'll do and mm -hmm. uh, how you'll justify it to yourself. And uh, I'm kind of shocked that I got to the point where I could be on the street handing an envelope and kind of saying, oh, this isn't me, I'm not doing this. Like, But mm -hmm. uh, I felt like a lot of me is still the same person before all this happened, so... It's uh, not like I was an evil guy and uh, setting out in this big premeditated um, uh, s s scam to try to do all these trades. I was just sort of answering the phone and she said this and I placed a trade and make the money and it, it kind of fell on itself. But uh, I don't think, I think it, it could happen to anybody if you're not mm -hmm. careful and if you're not uh, pretty well ethically grounded. Uh, when you reflect back on it, <clears throat> I mean, what are the, you know, how do you feel about yourself? Like, what are the emotions that you experience? Um, uh, I'm often angry because uh, uh, there's still guys working that did it much worse than me. And they never were just in, they were just in the right web of people that were not in the radar. So I feel sometimes resentment, like, wow, they're still at the, their careers now they're 37 and making all this money and mm -hmm. that's not fair because resentment excuse me there yeah the resentment and at the same time um i'm not glad it happened but i've been able to spend this time my daughters are five and three with them um a lot of my buddies live on a plane the nanny raises the children which everybody has to do what they have to do for their family but to have this time with them has been great so there's been some positives um, you know, I was 215 pounds at the end of my career and to find running and to get in shape. And right. I want to get into that. I mean, I can't imagine you were 215. Yeah, You're a yeah. bean pole, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so Tipper X goes public. Raj gets toppled. You're in the news. You're in the public eye. Uh, it's all out. Your parents are finding out. Right. And you're persona non grata right. and you're unemployed. Right. So how do you wake up the next day and move forward? Like how do you, uh, do, how do you figure out how you're going to start to piece your life back together? You've um, been I'm, sentenced, you're a felon, you've been out of work for quite a while. Right. Out of work at least over a year then. Um, I'm trying to figure out, I'm sending out resumes nonstop, but it's a non-starter. Anybody that calls me back, um, you know, you have to fill out the application. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes, but please still talk to me. Mm -hmm. Not at that job market, no. Like, that's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. So all the 2010 resumes are going out. Um, any inroads that I'm making pretty close to jobs? Okay, let us know when you get sentenced. And at the time, I'm thinking it's always a few months away, and it keeps getting pushed out, 2011, 2012, 2013, up to 2015. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I can't piece together... It's still a problem now. What's my next career going to be? Uh, and uh, nothing's happening. Because I understand, like, if, if if I'm a potential employer, this guy's coming to me with a felony, and maybe he's a good guy, but I can't hire this person because yeah. if I'm at sentencing, oh, Tom now works at XYZ, oh, they're in the news, like. Also, if anything ever happened, the employer's on the hook saying, yeah, I you could, know, why did you, you knew you hired this guy. Right. You know, I can tell like, them, I think I'm not going to jail, but they don't know that. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, uh, so nothing, nothing moved on that, has moved on that needle from 2010 to 2015. I mean, mm -hmm. And at some point, uh, running comes into the picture. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to stay at home dad, 2010. Uh, putting on weight, um, just not eating well, um, not sleeping well, just depressed, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but depression's like, a, like not just like 
a cavalier depressed, right. like de like clinically depressed. I think so. I didn't talk to anybody. I probably should have talked to a medical professional and at least uh, dealt with it that way. But mm -hmm. it's depressed. Um, got up. I think I was 190 at the start of 2010. Got up to 215 by 2011. Um, I decided um, when, I, when I was just sitting on the couch and eating junk food, or like uh, you know? just not exercising. Just my metabolism mm -hmm. finally caught up. Like I, I was a soccer player my whole life, and up till like age 30, uh, I stopped exercising at age 18. Didn't make the team at Penn, so didn't matter till I was kind of 30, 31, typical mm -hmm. guy. And then by 30, uh, 33, uh, I just. Uh, carry my daughter around out of breath like end of 2010 I had a, a pulmonary embolism scare mm. where uh, I couldn't breathe and had to go to the hospital my wife had to come home my mother-in-law had to watch my daughter and then I went into January 2011 for my uh, first annual physical since age 18 typical guy didn't go to the doctor unless something was wrong mm -hmm. he's like you know uh, you're uh, the BMI thing you're obese, uh, overweight on the line. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Like, I'm a skinny guy? Like, no, you're not. Like, technically obese. You're technically obese because 5'10", 215 was right on that line. Like, oh, my God. Like, he's like, you know, uh, I could tell you how it's going to go down. You're going to be 40 and getting in all the prescription medication for high blood pressure, and it runs in my family, and uh, cancer has been in my family and this is, this is what I see. Like you're going to have the sleep apnea probably when you're 39, 40, 41, we'll get mm -hmm. you the machine scaring me, mm -hmm. which is good. Um, and then, uh, my wife, as I said, was a swimmer, um, in college and she had run a few times a week and kind of did the 5k here and there. And, and so I told her after that, like, I'm going to sign up for the gym. And she's like, oh, it's January. <laughs> yeah, you, of course you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. January. You and everybody else. Yeah. So I said, no, I'm going to uh, sign up and see if I can just start walking a little bit and try to get some of this weight off. And she said, you know, in April, one of the towns next to us, there's this 5K. Like, maybe just try to get up to running three miles or something like that. So oh, that's a great mm -hmm. thing to put on the calendar. Like, sure, uh, I'll try that. And then kind of got where, uh, you know, the first 10 pounds get down to like 200 and I can actually like run a mile and then get outside a little bit and run two miles and feeling better. And then I've complete, you know, I break 30 minutes in my first 10, uh, 5k or whatever. And uh -huh. feeling some sense of accomplishment, like, okay, I've lost 20 pounds now and starting to, my knees aren't hurting anymore. And then kind of start to get the bug, like, what's next? Like a 10K, something like that? Like, okay, the 10K, let's do that next month and, mm -hmm. like, get up to six miles. And that was terrible because, like, that was twice the amount that I ever run. And what's after that? Like, the half marathon? Like, I'll just sign up for one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd never run further than, like, seven miles, you know, and getting the half marathon. Like, I walked, like, the last five miles, but whatever I accomplished, I did it. And... Uh, uh, started just losing more weight so I was down like probably 30 pounds by that point was feeling pretty good and um still uh, kind of eating whatever because hey I was running so uh running to eat mm -hmm. and uh did the half marathons <clears throat> for a while and then kind of got pretty good at the half marathon where I could thought maybe that half marathon time would translate to my Boston qualifier time with the marathon and then decided early 2013 to sign up for my first marathon mm -hmm and train for that. Um, and I got, uh, the 310 was the BQ and I got the 308. Uh, the problem was, uh, the bombings happened at Boston that year. So everybody mm -hmm. in the world who was a 230 marathoner signed up for 2014. And mm -hmm. right. the cutoff was eight seconds faster than what I had run. So didn't make eight it into sec Boston. Eight seconds. So I decided to run the marathon in the year. It was like the toughest cutoff ever. <laughs> oh, wow. So I missed it by eight seconds in 2014 and then missed it again by like six seconds for t this year. Oh, you did? Oh, so wow. I, I, I didn't really improve that much. Uh, uh -huh. I had a bad race the next year. And then so I did. Um, so 2013, first marathon was in uh, May. And then I went uh, to the library to start reading running books. And mm -hmm. then uh, Eat and Run was there and right. read that. And like sort of said like, oh, what you... Oh, what you eat affects how you feel. Like, wow, uh -huh. like, 
What a revelation. This guy has run all these, you know, 165 miles in 24 hours, won all these ultras, and he's eating, uh, um, like it's called vegan or something like that. I mm-hmm. told my wife, she's like, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. It's like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, some of those recipes, it's like Scott had some recipes in this book, and like, oh, I'll try that, and this and that. And I brought it back to the library, and the librarian's like, there's this other book. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, this guy's vegan too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm always the follow-up. <laughs> the follow-up book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you like this, you might like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I read your book, and uh, like I was told my wife, like, so I just there's the only two books in ultra running in the library, and both these guys have the same type of diet. That's like right. Do really the, interesting. Do the math. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I looked into it, and then uh, looked online, and there was the Rips book, like mm-hmm. 28 Days to Get There. I'm like, this seems pretty doable. Like, chick, the dairy, and then the chicken, and like mm-hmm. the meat was easy, but the dairy is tough and yeah. to get rid of. And so it was definitely hard. So you did the engine two thing. I did the engine two for mm-hmm. uh, the four four weeks and got through it. And so what was the? So you you lost a bunch of weight doing just the running, but then what was the difference when you decided to like? Uh, adopt I, the... I just started running as many miles as I could every week, and like mm-hmm. it wasn't affecting me. So uh, I got up to fifty five miles a week um, when I was still eating meat in that marathon, my first marathon. I got up to seventy miles a week in the fall marathon when I had been, I would say like eighty percent plant based. On the weekend, if we went out to dinner in a restaurant, mm-hmm. I'd reward myself with whatever. And then uh, in early 2014, I started running like 100 miles a week, and I was recovering. I was being smart. I was, you know, like 80% easy, 20% hard, Mm -hmm. five days easy, two days hard. Mm -hmm. So I was never doing the training, but the mileage was going nuts. Like no coach would ever have told me to go from 55 to 100 peak in a year. Mm -hmm. But I was feeling really good and um, ended up breaking three hours in the marathon last fall. Mm. And... uh, I still felt like I was in better shape than that, but whatever. Marathon's really hard to predict, and yeah. And so now this year, um, I just ran like 130 miles last week. Oh wow! And like I feel fine. Like I don't know. Right. How to explain. Like, <laughs> like I like I I found an elite marathoner's plan. Like I think I can do this. Like if I wake up early enough. Um, and so. I don't want to do a marathon now. I'd like to wait and give it a year to see if I could do the next 10 minute increment down to below 250 Mm -hmm. so i found um i was looking for ultra marathons and you know in uh california you run up mountains run up down mountains in new Mm -hmm. york new jersey it's like you run around these timed events right flat ultras right 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 so i found this uh race and i'd never done an ultra and it said 12 hours or 24 i signed up for 12 and then i told a buddy i don't know if you know him he did epic five last year chris solars uh i know the name it was two guys from new york that did it last year yeah yeah yeah. I don't know him personally. But. And so I sent him, um, he's like, what are you running? I'm like, I just, I'm going to go up to like 150 miles this spring. I think, I think I can do mm-hmm. it. He's like, uh, you have to run the 24 hour, not the 12 hour. <laughs> like, oh. So yeah. So I emailed the race director just last week and I'm doing the 24. And, wow. When is that? Uh, May 16th. And if you run nice. 135 miles, you qualify for the national team. Mm-hmm. And like, I think I can do it. Like I've never run, I mean, raced above a marathon, but I mean, it's probably, I probably hopefully will do it in my life, but maybe not this time, but mm-hmm. I have this ridiculous goal and I really think like I can run, I can do it. Like, I don't know, I can explain uh, uh, how I'm running all these miles, but it's right. It's working, I don't know. Well, uh, the biggest difference between what you were doing before with your running and what you're doing now is what you're eating, Yes. right? Yeah. And so you're experiencing this extraordinary recovery time. Yeah. You're ramping yeah. up. I mean, you're doing... There are very few people on the planet that are running more miles a week than that. Right. You know, no. so you're you're, yeah. you're peaking out. Yeah. I mean, there's not much more you can do. No, right? I mean, I, I don't want to do more because then I'm doing doubles every day and I can't do triples because I mm-hmm. have the kids <laughs> watching. Right. I, I don't want to... You didn't run here from New Jersey. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Didn't do that, but uh, I plan to get up to 150 at my peak week, and I think I can manage that with um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday marathons, back to back to back. And I think if I can do that, then I feel good about running the 135. But mm-hmm. it may not happen this time, but I think I can get there. And it's just so nice to have this crazy goal that only like 15 guys ran that much last year. And it's funny, like the trail ultras and the flat ultras, a completely different mm-hmm. world. Like the guys that ran these 
flat ultras, big mileage aren't the same names as the trail ultras. It's just yeah, it's a different. It's a yeah. different sport, kind yeah. of. You yeah. know, like what Killian Jornet does. Yeah, and yeah. Timothy Olson, like you know, they're jackrabbits. Right. You know, it's right. A, it's a different thing. Right. And so around New Jersey, it's like I'm going to go out to the state fairgrounds, run a mile, and get heckled by people eating funnel cake. Like, why are you exercising? <laughs> <laughs> My friends will be out there with their PBRs. <laughs> uh huh. What are you doing? What are you running from? <laughs> There's a certain like mental discipline with that though, because you have to combat that like you know the the inevitable like the repetitive boredom of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, that makes it different. Um, <clears throat> but you know that's rather extraordinary. So I'm interested in in exploring like the relationship between you know the running and the diet and kind of how you're navigating this purgatory that you're in right now so, and how that's you know sort of a self um yeah so I, my diet uh went basically all plant-based last year um running more miles uh the part of my life that's still a problem is the employment uh part i've got sort of uh physical taken care of uh emotional is pretty good uh mental um it's all pretty good now, but it's just uh, not. It's not where it should be. But the, the main holdback in my life right now is employment. And I'm just hoping. It sounds silly, but I'm hoping if I keep running, something good will happen. But mm -hmm. uh, but how is the running like helping you like emotionally like oh, kind of cope with it's, everything? It's that's great. Going on? Um, uh, kind of getting out um, for like an hour and a half in the morning and an hour at night and. Uh, I don't know if I'm, it's not, I don't know if I'm meditating, but I'm kind of getting into a zone where I look down and five miles go by and it feels like mm -hmm. five minutes. And, um, yeah, that I'm, active meditative state. I think so. Yeah. I'm running a lot of loops. So I have a lot of half mile loops to get ready for the mile loop race and just not worrying about traffic or stoplights. And I'm just going and going and going. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like, uh, very therapeutic. Um, and so I am into the craving the endorphins now and, um, it's really helping me deal with um, the situation of, of having some uncertainty or major uncertainty now to what my next career is going to be. Mm -hmm. I feel conflicted a little bit, like maybe I should just run, be running singles and spend the other part of the day looking for work or something, but um, I feel so good doing this uh, that I hope it's going to lead to something. I hope my next career has something running related. Mm -hmm to it um and uh it's my kids think it's pretty cool like they i want to set a good example for them and to uh, to be fit and to have mm -hmm. goals and uh everybody i tell this goal to now they can't i mean most of them aren't runners and they just like what right. are you but but because you're unemployed like this gives structure to your day it does and, yeah and a, and, a, and a sense of purpose outside of just family you know it does and right child rearing um, that I would imagine kind of anchors your It does. Yeah. I can, uh, like by 7 a.m., I've already accomplished like a lot mm -hmm. like for the day and uh, it gets my day going. And, uh, you know, I'm up at uh, 4.30 and uh, have my Urban Mate tea and uh, I just uh, spend a few minutes just uh, drinking my tea and then uh, – Either my wife goes out for her run or I go out for mine, and it's just a nice, quiet time. And uh, and then at 7 a.m., I've, I've run 10 or 15 miles or whatever, and I feel like I've accomplished something for the day. And mm -hmm. it, it keeps me really uh, grounded and uh, ready to think about uh, what to do that day. And so the events of your life and these decisions that you've made have led to a place where you know, the life that you're leading couldn't be more distinct from the life of the, yeah. the, the hedge fund manager, right? right? Like the idea of getting up and quietly sipping your yerba mate in a meditative state is not, yeah. the, is not you know, yeah. it's not what a hedge fund manager does, right? Yeah. So you're, you know, I, I see it as, you know, quite frankly, it's like a, it's a spiritual evolution. You yeah, know, I really so. look at it like that. And this is happening for a reason, whatever that reason may be. And now you're in this place where you've been compelled to look at yourself in the mirror and you're, and evaluate, you know, these choices that you've made and adjust accordingly. And now you're making these different choices about your daily lifestyle habits that right. have kind of crafted a completely different individual. Right. So 
when you look back on your former life, like if somebody said to you here, you know what, I know you're a felon, but you know, forget about the legalities of it. Like in a, in a utopian world, if they said, you know what, here's your, here's your job back at this really nice hedge fund. I could do it. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I'll ever be able to take a desk job anymore. Um, I say that, but if it's the best thing for my family and I get, you know, a job I can't turn down, I'm going to have to figure out how to work the running around it and, but I can't imagine going back and doing what I was doing before with all the other stuff aside, like if I'm just doing legitimate work and back at the firm, I can't. Because? Just because I'm a new person now in this. Um, what is the difference? I found a passion. Like uh, um, I was just kind of going about my day. Um, you know, I, I guess my passion changed. I was passionate about the market. I miss a lot of the people I worked with. And now I have something new that's come out of this uh last couple of years and um, I'm just not uh, into the same things I was in before. I've kind of found a new um, new passion in life. Uh, I guess it's not something I needed to go to business school for, but mm -hmm. it's... Can you find gratitude in that? Uh, I think so, yeah. Um, but you're not quite there yet. Not quite there yet. I'm not... Uh, Do you think that you'll look back someday and think I'm grateful that all of that happened because now I'm living this completely I, I hope life. to be there I hope to be there um, so you're I'm not there you're, yet you're not yeah yeah I have still have a lot of regret and mm -hmm. uh, I still feel bad about what I had to do <clears throat> but at the same time I'm not at that dark place of looking at the elevator button and that's all behind me and uh, my children know who I am I'm like I'm like uh president of the PTA at the preschool organizing right. the fundraiser so yeah, I'm like dad. super dad like, yeah doing the dad thing with all the moms and the, and the community volunteering and all right this kind of right thing, recognized right. by the community and uh so most of those people I mean they still even though with all the articles that come out they're not going to know about mm -hmm. and if they do I mean if somebody has a problem with it it's their problem like I I guess it's it's lucky also that your daughters are so young that yeah. it's not you know by the time they're of the age to understand everything, like right. this will be, you know, quite distant in the yeah, past. Yeah, I think so. Know. I always think about how am I going to tell them when, obviously, they're, they're too young, but uh, it's a good lesson for them, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. uh, Have you thought about, like, how you would talk to them about what happened? How that conversation is uh, going to go when they're I old enough? I haven't thought about it yet because they just know daddy's at home, mommy works. Mm -hmm. And I say, Daddy used to work, and they laugh. No. <laughs> <laughs> daddies, daddies don't work, or daddies work, but you don't work. You stay with us. Um, I haven't thought about how I try to explain that to them yet. I just try mm -hmm. to set a good example now and hope they uh, grow up and make better decisions than I made. And I was talking to a priest about it at a pretty low time in 2008 at our church, and he said, Tom, 99% of your life, you did the right thing. 1% of your life, you did something bad. Don't let 1% define your life. Mm -hmm. I thought that was like pretty good advice. Uh, don't let four decisions you made, getting caught up in things and having a lapse in judgment, define, uh, and it defined my life, I think, 2008, up until when I started running, and now I'm not letting those decisions define my life. It's still a major hindrance on finding my next uh, career and mm -hmm. where that's going to go. What's the, uh, what's the, what's the dream job then? Like the realistic dream job. <sighs> I'd like to have some combination of maybe a uh, running coach and maybe getting my uh, plant-based nutrition certificate from Cornell or mm -hmm. some of that combination like that. But I'll have to run the 135 before I'm a legitimate coach. <laughs> I think I haven't done anything yet. I think it's a pretty realistic goal for you. Yeah, I think so. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing stopping you from getting the certificate. Right, right. You can do that anytime. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, what I'd like to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and just, uh, I've always wanted, like, enjoyed helping people. I volunteer at the church when I can and move clothes around. And uh, it's like, uh, I know you're so familiar with just the epidemic that this country has with uh, obesity and if I could help people out. And I try to lead by example. I don't try to push this diet on anyone. My wife doesn't do it. My kids don't do it. Mm -hmm. I just try to lead by example and say, uh, hey, I'm not getting injured. Maybe it's because of what I'm eating. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, like, uh-huh. um, and so uh, cause I, I have like a little running club and nobody runs more than maybe 70 miles and they're like, what are you doing? Like, right. Aren't you, why are you doing elite marathon or mileage? Like, <clears throat> I'm able to do it. I don't know. Like, it's just, uh, maybe I'm built for this type of event or something. I don't know. But um, it's, uh, it's going to lead to something, I hope. Um, mm. If you could go back and uh, greet yourself on your first day at the hedge fund, what, what would the advice be that you would give the younger version of yourself? Uh, with everything that you've, you know, experienced. Right. Uh, would be, uh, you know, do the right thing, uh, stick, to, stick to your fundamental research, but also follow your passion in life. Uh, um, and so I think... But you if, wouldn't have even known, at that point, you wouldn't know what your passion was. You would have no. said, you would have identified your passion as just Picking being, stocks. yeah, like basically okay. doing what you were doing, right? Right, right. And it took, it, took, it took an extraordinary dismantling of your life for you to get to a place where you could even begin the process of trying to truly explore what your passion might be or, right. or who you really are, you know, outside of this, you know, this world, this costume that you're putting right. on every day. It's a tough... Um it's a tough position because I, uh, somebody asked me, are you happy or not happy, but are you glad this all happened? And there's a lot of positives that have come out of it, but it, I'm not glad to have a felony. Like nobody would say that. So, mm-hmm. um, if I could go back and talk to my 30 year old self, 29 year old self, um, yeah, I could say, Oh, <laughs> she's going to call you in 2007. Don't, don't do those trades. But I think anybody at the time, would have been very tempted to do what I did. And uh, I don't know if anything I say now would have changed what happened uh, when Mm -hmm. it did. Mm -hmm. Um, Disappointed in myself, but I'm also, I can't keep flogging myself. I just have to move on. The past is in the past. And, uh, you know, it's, things are starting now and Mm -hmm. I just have to look to the future and hopefully peace out. Uh, I'm going to make a living and help support my family. Uh, the stay-at-home dad thing is fine, but I've got to. We can't survive on that forever, right. so I've got to right, right. do something. And my wife has been incredibly supportive, letting me run these crazy miles and seeing it's my passion. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not. We can't. Something has to fall into place where I can. Uh, it's up to me to figure out yeah. what I need to do. And I, I keep, I guess, hoping something falls in my lap. And My uh, unsolicited opinion yeah. <laughs> on it is, uh, I don't know. I mean, my, I think that, that we're here on earth to grow. We're here to have experiences, to learn from them, and to grow from them. And to the extent that um, you can take what has happened to you and find a way to uh, translate that um, into your own personal growth and then use that to be of service to other people. The more that you can get out of yourself and your predicament and try to um, be of counsel or be of service through large actions and small to your kids, to your wife, to your community, potentially to, you know, the investment community in whatever way you can identify, the more that you are in that place, truly in that place of just here to serve, then the details of how you're going to make a living and what happens next, I think will sort themselves out. Right. No, I mean, I agree. I've, uh, um, reading Jab Jab, uh, Oh, Gary Van book. Yeah, so book. I gotta start, I gotta start, <laughs> yeah. I gotta start jabbing because, yeah. uh, Right. Giving, yeah. Right. It's, it's along the same line of thinking I have right now. I just have to piece that together. And other than other than your wife and your priest, are you getting any other? Are are you able to talk to anyone else to help you process through all of this? Uh, I haven't talked to anybody else. Um, mm-hmm. I thought about life coaches and that type of thing, but I don't know if mm-hmm. that's 
kind of skeptical of that. And maybe I could be a life. My coach. wife could put together a pretty good syllabus for you of yeah. spiritual. Rather than reading Gary V, right? Let's get you on some spiritual texts no, and help no. you like really like sort of emotionally and spiritually navigate this because I yeah. think that I think that you can come out the other side of this. And my hope for you, and my expectation for you is that you can get to a place where you truly, at your core, can look back on this and, and be grateful that it happened for you, for yourself, for your kids, and for your family. That'd be great. I, I want to be there, too, and I'm not there yet, but I hope to mm -hmm. be. Maybe you can come back and tell me about it when you get there. That'd be great. Yeah? Let's, uh, let's do it. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thanks for talking to me. Thanks, Rich. I All wish right. you the best. Thank you. And I appreciate you coming out today. No problem. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Peace. Bye.